Welcome in on this Wednesday morning, everybody. Hope you had a good Tuesday. Hope you're primed to have a great hump day Wednesday as we got a lot going on once again today, and it starts early. Phillies, 115. That's awesome. We love that. Got some master stuff going on today, which we're all excited about in the office. Today is the part three contest. I haven't checked the weather down in Augusta, but I know it was supposed to be a little iffy tomorrow for the opening round, but then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday are supposed to be beautiful. Hopefully, when the Phillies come home after their game today, hopefully the weather will clear up here because that looks a little iffy too. But hope you're having a great, great hump day. And not a great night last night as far as the sports world went. But guess what? We're here for you. We're here to tell you the front page news. Now, the front page. The stories everyone's talking about. 97.5, The Fanatic. All right, we're going to start positive on this Wednesday after a busy, busy night of Philadelphia sports. I don't know how you all handled it. I had to do back and forth. I didn't set up another TV. So I went back and forth with the Flyers and the Sixers, but the Flyers helped us out so you could just concentrate on the Sixers, and then it was the Phillies on my phone. But we'll start off with your Philadelphia 76ers as they beat the Detroit Pistons last night, 120-102. to It's their sixth win in a row. Um, kind of wonky there at the beginning, just back and forth. Detroit was hanging. little disappointed earlier in the day that we hear that Tyrese Maxey coming off his 52-point performance was out with a tight hip. And that Kyle Lowry was also out yesterday. So we get that news in the afternoon. I was very excited on this show this time yesterday saying that I was excited to see how Nick Nurse was going to handle this rotation, handle the starting lineup. What are we going to see? Well, we didn't get a chance to see that last night because those two guys sat out. I guess it's okay. It didn't really matter. It looks like he knows what he wants to do. He's looking to get guys rest. He's looking to go into the playoffs fully healthy uh Sixers sit at 45 and 35 the seventh seed they do not hold the tiebreaker with the heat so if those two tie the Sixers would play a playing game at Miami which isn't ideal uh but there's still some things to play out there Joel Embiid spectacular last night once again 37 points 11 rebounds eight assists three steals two blocks I mean he just looks so comfortable out there. And I, I do keep going back to, and I've told you guys this many times, to a uh, an executive in the league that, that texted me midseason before Embiid got hurt, a guy that's been in the league for 40-plus years, and just said, my God, I can't believe how easy this game looks to him. It, it appeared that way again last night. Now, I think we may have jinxed him on this show yesterday when we had Bill Calarulo with us, Ray. I think we may have jinxed Joel Embiid where I said, have you noticed since he's come back, he's really not going to the floor all that much? Nah, he was a broom last night. You saw him down there numerous, numerous, numerous times uh, falling to the floor. I know people hold their breath every time on it, uh, understandably so, but he got through unscathed, and the Sixers come out with a win. Since returning, Joel Embiid, 30 points a game. Think about that. Missed two months because of knee surgery, comes back and in limited minutes for the first couple of games, averages 30 points a game on 51.4% shooting from the floor. He's just been outstanding. Our big topic yesterday was how is Nick Nurse going to use the other pieces? What's going to happen? Where's the starting lineup going to go? What would you like to see? Well, what you saw last night was Tobias Harris go for 15 points and 12 rebounds. Looks pretty good offensively, and he's just coming back from a banged-up knee, so that was good to see. Kelly Oubre, sixth straight game of 15 or more points. He had 17 last night, but I think the bigger one, I think the one that kind of sets everybody up a little bit here, Buddy Heald looked so comfortable and so confident and had so much fun last night, and he shot five for nine for three on his way to 18 points. First real time we've seen him on the floor uh, for an extensive amount with Joel Embiid. You saw the one to two passes that went to him where he was open. You saw inbounds plays 
where he was coming off picks and getting passes right there in the corner, and he banged threes there. I thought last night Buddy Heald was used ideally of what we thought the way he should be used when you got him here at the trade deadline with Joel Embiid in a lineup. So that was good to see, him coming off picks from Embiid, him setting himself up knowing that Embiid was getting doubled. All of those things were good to see last night from the Sixers, even though you're going against a bad team in Detroit, and you were shorthanded without Kyle Lowry and Tyrese Maxey. So the way it plays out, the uh, Sixers play Friday here against Orlando. Sunday afternoon here against Brooklyn. They need Miami to lose one of their final two games in order to get a game up on them and be able to host. We'll see how that plays out. Miami had a tough game last night, went to overtime against Atlanta and pulled it out. You were hoping that that wouldn't happen. It doesn't look like the Sixers are going to be able to jump up and get that sixth seed and take that from from uh, Indiana. So we'll see. Uh, they're going to be the seventh or the eighth seed, and you're probably going to have that play in game. Your Philadelphia Phillies, they lost three to nothing. Zach Wheeler, decent outing. Seven innings, six hits, three earned runs, five strikeouts. Got a little bit pinched by an umpire, gave up a home run. Uh, but altogether, I, I would call that a good outing, I would say. And Rob Thompson, I thought the real bad part of the game, and I'll explain it deeper after we hear, hear from Rob Thompson about what he had to say about the hitting. Uh, I, I don't know if, if everybody's doing that, but, uh, but that typically happens when you're when you're going through something like this you just got to relax and get back to their game is like is it is more is the lack of quality contact or the chase i mean what would you consider to be like a bigger factor both you know we're not creating a slug right now and that's part of our mo and, and uh, you know tonight and I, I think the last few games we've been pretty good with Staying in the strike zone tonight, we, we got out of the zone a little bit. All right, let me go over it with you exactly what Rob Thompson was talking about. The beginning of it was, are they trying too hard? Here's how it played out last night. And I, I saw some of the, the, the national people that cover the Phillies regularly. We're questioning this a little bit. Like, you know, is, is this starting to become a concern? Okay, let me take you through it. Top of the fourth, Trey Turner leads off and steals second. Goes nowhere, three outs right after that. Top of the fifth. First and second, one out. Rojas hits into a double play. Top of the sixth, you go walk, walk, and Bryce Harper. Nobody out. Bryce Harper hits into a double play, and then a strikeout. Top of the seventh. First and second. and th First, second, and third with one out. Bases loaded. Merrifield strikes out. Schwarber strikes out. Inning over. Top of the eighth. You get a leadoff single, and then Harper strikes out, Stubb strikes out, Boehm lines out. They struck out 13 times last night. Uh, look, you don't want to overplay it. And it's funny, I laugh at, you know, we've all covered, or no, I shouldn't say we've all. I've covered a lot of games where teams lose and they didn't play their best. It's, it's not the scary time to ask questions. It's not like the, the march up the aisle to a funeral or anything like that. It's just... Hey, you guys really didn't hit tonight. Is that something you're pressing on or whatever? Uh, and Rob Thompson answered it the way he did. Okay, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. You got an afternoon game today. I didn't see it, Ray. I don't know if you did. But I saw it today in a story and stuff I was reading. Real Mewtwo got Real Mewtwo got hit in the neck with a foul ball. Did it look to be pretty serious? I'm asking you because I didn't see it and I don't know. Did it look to be pretty serious? It didn't look good. Uh, I mean, he got hit in the throat and that that did not look yeah. like something that was uh fun at all okay. so I, he was down the Stubbs obviously comes in the game i would be really surprised to see him today yeah probably in a 115 game or whatever but he gets out of the game early last night is there anybody besides jt real muto that that it wouldn't surprise if he's out there today you know, hopefully it's nothing major. Hopefully he's okay. I can't even imagine getting hit with a ball in the throat. Back in the day, they used to have the long things that came down because, um, God, you probably don't remember this, but it was a Dodgers game, and I barely do. Guy uh, broke his bat. There was a catcher on deck. Guy broke his bat, was on deck, not catching, and the, the bat went into his neck. I think it was like Steve Garvey or something. And then all the protective neckwear started to come out for catchers after that. So hopefully he's okay. Today you have Lance Lynn 
going for the Cardinals against Aaron Nola. Man, today would be a great day just to see Aaron Nola go out there and pitch a gem and stop whatever it is. Your Philadelphia Flyers, uh, I, I thank them last night because as you're trying to juggle all of us out there, we were trying to juggle three games at once. Uh, they get down, let up a goal. I think it was 65 seconds into the game. Second goal, Canadians are wide open out in front. Get another one. Canadians were wide open all night long. And the Flyers wind up getting behind six to nothing. At one time, both Flyers and, and, and Phillies combined were down nine to nothing. So that wasn't good. But after the game, John Tortorella had this to say about his club, which has now lost eight straight. For the most part, it's uncharacteristic of the club. And uh, uh, even though when we've been going through the losing here, uh, the last couple of games, Columbus and here, we, we've just we've done some things that we haven't done for a lot of the year. And uh, so you got to eat it, and uh, we got to stay together and try to solve things. Uh, whether it's enough time to do what we want to do to try to get in, I'm not concerned about that. I'm just I'm concerned about just being pros, uh, trying to get some of our dignity back. Uh, and just playing the right way. I think that's the most important part that uh, uh, we've got to stay together with. I have, uh, in my career, uh, been asked to maybe write a story that says this coach must go. I never wanted to write it. I never did write it. Um, and I'm not saying that about John Tortorella. What I'm saying is it's fair enough to question. Uh, you know, like John Kincaid was saying earlier, look, there was no expectations for this team to make the playoffs, so don't act like it now. Well, yeah, but there was. There wasn't at the beginning of the season, but there was a month ago. And quite simply, all you had to do was play the type of hockey that we expected them to play at the beginning of the season, and that's like 350, 400 winning hockey. That's all they had to do down the stretch to make the playoffs, and they did it. They fell into this awful collapse. There's going to be questions about John Tortorella, and as I said on the crossover, and you know why? Because the first person that probably is going to question John Tortorella is John Tortorella. And he'll come out and he'll be, as he said, he's transparent, open, and honest. He's probably questioning him himself about some of the way things, you know, were handled. You can talk about talent. You can talk about this team is getting embarrassed by teams that aren't good. And that, that's, that's not acceptable. And that has nothing to do with what your expectations were earlier in the season before the season started. All you had to do was beat teams that weren't as good as you, according to the standings, or just keep your head afloat in a 10, 12, 14 game stretch and you haven't, you, you, you've just crapped it out. Uh, so I think expectations were correct a month and a half ago that you expected them to make the playoffs because they didn't have to do anything more than to keep their head above water. Well, they haven't done that. It is very similar to the Eagles. I know there's a difference in talent. I know the Eagles, you know, we're 10 and one and they have, you know, all pros here, there and the other and the Flyers don't. Uh, it, it's still the same to me. It, it's still baffling how bad a team can look in the last handful of games, two handful of games of the season. So we'll look at that. And and another point that was brought up on the morning show that I didn't, I, I, I think John came out, I don't want to misspeak. I think John said if they'd have had Carter Hart, they would have made the playoffs. I, I never thought about how individually, and I said it to somebody earlier this morning, they said he wasn't lighting the, the you know, the, the world on fire with his goaltending either. I understand what John's saying. It's more than just the goalie being in goal for a game. It's the whole fallout effect. It's uh, Sam Erson having to play all of these games when he was supposed to be a backup goalie. It's not having a decent backup goalie for a long, long time and then bringing somebody over that you just plug in from Russia and say, yeah, now you're the backup goalie. I, I don't know if I can say absolutely they would have made the playoffs if that thing with Carter Hart never happened, but... It's, it's certainly a fair thing to look at. So so there's that. Those are your front page headlines. And as I'm driving in today, I, I, I'll get into this a little bit more. And, and I, I think I'm going to have to ask Father Sean to, come, to call in next segment. Because it is really disturbing what has been going on in the Philadelphia sports scene since November of 2022 i'm gonna break down i think it's six i think we had one two three four five maybe seven different things that have happened in the philadelphia sports scene that when i remind you of them and give you the particulars of them 
it's going to somewhat blow your mind. So we'll take a closer look at that. Raymond, how are you today? How's everything in your life? I'm doing great, Bob. Yeah, you I, went I, out to dinner last night to celebrate your grandmom's birthday. Yes, it was wonderful. Great time. Good meal over there at Fires, Firebirds in Collegeville. So I had a nice, nice time seeing my family. Uh, the rest of the night, as for the sports teams, not as nice. But, no. Hey, Sixers won. That's nice. Yeah. And, you know, as we do every day on this show, we put everything out there right at the beginning of the show of all the teams so that your reaction can be there. And you're more than welcome to give them. 610-632-0975. You can call in. You know how much we love to talk sports here. Or if you can't do the talking, you can text that same number, 610-632-0975, and let us know what you're thinking. In the middle of last night's Sixers game, as I was doing show prep while I'm watching it, I thought to myself as Detroit's cutting the lead down to like three and four, and you're like, ah, oh, come on, no Lowry, no Maxi. My thought was, and I, I think this a lot when I'm watching games, especially of last night, what exactly are the Sixers getting out of this game? Because at that time, it was, like I said, four-point game, middle of the game, and you're thinking... They're not playing all that well. Yes, Embiid's doing what Embiid does, but look at the competition. I'm looking for other things. You got to take something out of a game. And I didn't want the Sixers to win a three- or four-point game and just be like, okay, they won because Detroit stinks. And, and you can tell Detroit's done with the season. I mean, I don't know how many times the Sixers got a rebound last night and you saw five Detroit guys just standing there and the Sixers outletted, ran the floor, and got a layup. Uh, they're just done, and it's understandable. But I was really worried you weren't going to get anything out of that game last night. But then, but then Buddy Heald starts to find open space and shoots five for nine from three. And it's more than that. Buddy Heald's a really good three-point shooter. And everybody couldn't wait for him to team up with Joel Embiid and see how open he could get. He looked like he had so much fun being on the floor with Joel Embiid last night. Does what he does. Boom. He goes for 18 points, like I said, five three-pointers. Great. More than that, they were running plays for him off of inbounds passes. They were finding him open when, jo when Joel Embiid was getting double teamed. Thought that was perfect. Kelly Oubre is just proving himself to be a scorer on this team. A, I'm not going to think about it. I'm taking the ball to the basket. If I'm open, I'm shooting. Type of scorer for this team, which is exactly what you need. For the sixth straight game, I believe it was, for the, I don't have it here, for the, yes, I do, sixth straight game, Kelly Oubre goes for more than 15 points. That's what you're looking for. That's great. 17 again last night. He's a guy that can beat people off the dribble. He's that perimeter guy that this team has been looking for for so many years. Then you get the Anthony Melton coming off the bench. Missed a couple of threes, but also made, I know he made at least one. Looked spry. I mean, at one point he closed out on a guy, and you could see his speed. He was denying at the defensive end of the floor. D'Anthony Melton's a really good perimeter defender. And if you're going to play that team up in Boston, that's what you need is perimeter defense. If he can provide that, if he can come out and give you a little bit of something, there, there's a lot of goodness there. Campaign looked fine last night again. Probably going to be the backup to Kyle Lowry once he you know, gets back out on the floor. But it became evident to me last night. Oh, you also had Joel Embiid. I don't know if you noticed it last night, Ray. I know you were having dinner with Nona. Joel Embiid was paired on the floor with Paul Reed again for a significant amount last night. There are things going on in the head of Nick Nurse that I don't know if we're going to know what they are until the playoffs come, but I think he's thinking about an awful lot. All right, listen, we have everything on the table for you, and here's a little extra something-something, and Mike will get to you when we get back from the break. This is Rapid Trivia Wednesday. That's right. We are going to give you, after your call and you talk about Philadelphia sports, all the things that we've brought up, I will throw out a trivia question to you. If you get it correct, you will go into a drawing to win two tickets to a Dave Matthews Band concert. All right? So I want you to call, talk about some of the subjects we brought up with the Philadelphia teams, whether it's your disappointment in the Flyers, where you think the Sixers are going to go, the Phillies hitting, is it bad, is it okay, because it's not hitting season yet, all of those things. And then we will fire a trivia question at you at the end of our conversation. If you get it right, we'll put you in for a chance to win a couple of tickets to see Dave Matthews. 610-632-0975. That's where you call. That's where you text. 610-632-0975. 
This is Midday Shows. Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. 76ers keep rolling. I'm Ray Dunn. This update is brought to you by Nifty 50s, a 10-time best Philly winner with delicious burgers, fresh-cut fries, and...
The best show ever with Tyrone Johnson, Ricky Vitalico, and Chance Gordo. Right now, it's Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic, and 97.5thefanatic.com. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you're having a great hump day. A lot of stuff going on in the Philadelphia and national sports world. As the Masters get started tomorrow, it's funny, whenever I say Masters on the air, golf on the air, I always feel like we probably get a lot of the listening audience, and I understand that roll their eyes a little bit, like, oh, who cares? And I want to talk about that a little bit later, because there's a lot of people that love the Masters, but there's a lot of people that can't stand it, and I understand. I love it, but I understand there's one thing that gets on my nerves with the Masters, and I'll tell you about that later, and I want to hear what maybe some of yours are. But we have a lot of stuff going on, and what, one of the things that I'm going to bring up in a minute after we talk to Mike is the disappointment we've had over the last 11 months, and I don't like it. I don't want to be this, oh, look how bad things are. I'm not. Like, with bad, with, with hurt in sports, there has to be good. You only get hurt because of expectations, because things were supposed to be better than they were, all of those things. But when I point out all of these different things to you, I don't want you to be upset about it. I want to say, like, wow, that, that's crazy. So that's why I'm kind of calling out Father Sean. I, I, I don't know. I don't want to be, you know, disrespectful at all. But Father Sean's a huge sports fan. I, I think we need, and I don't want to use this term lightly. I'm very cautious of it. But do we need an exorcism of the bad sports gods? Because when I, when I read down to you what has gone on in 11 months, there's some of the particulars you might not remember. It just isn't good. And are, neither are the Flyers right now. Mike in New Jersey wants to talk about it. Mike, you're on 97.5 The Fanatic. Good morning. How are you? Good, Mike. What's going on? I'm just confused right now about the Flyers. You're confused? Yeah. I, like, How do they go from being a playoff team to not winning a single game? Well, some here would say that they didn't have the talent to be that playoff team to begin with. So that maybe they're showing their true colors now. I say if you're that close to being able to make a playoff, your expectations have to change. There's no reason you're winning only one of your last ten games. I don't care who you are. So, yeah, the disappointment's everywhere. It's terrible. And uh, I have one question for you. Okay. Do you think uh, ever since uh, Torch's press conference, after he called everybody soft, that's when they started losing? Do you think it has to do with anything like with that? Uh, thanks, Mike. I don't, I, I don't know about that because he called them soft and they were in the middle of being pretty bad. Like if you, you, you have to go all the way back to March 14th. Since March 14th, the Sixers, or the Sixers, the Flyers have won two games and have lost 8, 9, 10, 11. 11. They've won two and lost 11 since March 14th. Tortorella coming out and calling him soft was only about 10 days ago, something like that. I will say, yeah, there, there are questions about the way John Tortorella has handled this team towards the end of the season. But I will say that any time a coach is out there as much as he is, that is as I, I've called it intriguing all the time. You can call it ridiculous. Oh, I also have to get to a, to a tweet that we got yesterday that I thought was unfair about all this. But... Whenever a coach is out there saying all the things that John Tortorella says, they're going to leave themselves open for questioning. And, look, I'm not being unfair here. John Tortorella himself questions sometimes the way he handles things. I say, look, if you're going to question Nick Sirianni, any other coach that has a complete meltdown at the end of the season, John Tortorella isn't above that. And I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he comes out and says the exact same thing. Now, if, you know, you get management comes out and says, no, Tortorella's our guy. They did things this year that we never expected and the growth that we needed and from individual players and as a team, we saw that. I, I'm fine with that, too. I'm okay if they truly believe that. But, yeah, there's questions abound about it. Now, yesterday, one of our, one of our friendly listeners, Ray, and I have to call it up here, Joanne, I believe. Joanne Burke, am I right? Did you see this by any chance yesterday, Ray? No. Okay, so Joanne is a good friend of the show. Have met her, I believe, at, at uh, Fan Fest many times, whatever. And Joanne's always nice and good friend. And that's okay. That I, I, That's fine. You question us. I'm not saying you can't. But she says, for the love of God, stop talking about torts. I can't stand torts. I'll say Tortorella. About Tortorella. Though, yes, he was the wrong coach for this team when hired and now. Should have been gone when new upper management came in. 
Why is there so much worshiping at the altar of torts? No clue. Yesterday, Bill called him out and said he was wrong for saying the team was soft and then the next couple of days saying, you know, we, we just got to be better and we can be better and all that stuff. I haven't praised him all year. I said he intrigues me in good ways and bad in that I kind of understand what the process is with the rebuild. But praise of Tortorella, has there been any of that on this show? I think we have actually been the one hugging the fence of, of this uh, entire station's feeling on torts. I feel like the way it moved through the day here on this station, the, the torts feeling changes. I think the morning show is giving him quite a bit of a pass. I think us here, we've kind of looked at, we've gotten more critical of him. And then I think uh, the best show ever has looked also more critical at him. I, I To me... I don't think we've been worshiping at the altar. No. I think we've given him some benefit of the doubt on, okay, look at the defense, look at, you know, the goal, the situation at goal, and then just the fact that, okay, they're here. How did they get here? He deserves some credit for getting them here, but he absolutely deserves the criticism of them falling off. Like, that, this team has utterly collapsed. Utterly. utterly. Uh, compared to whatever expectation you had a month ago, they have absolutely collapsed. There's no other way to frame it, you know, look at it, put it together for you for this season, regardless of what you thought in October, what you thought in March was that you were at least getting playoff hockey here in Philadelphia, and you're not going to get it. And it's because, not because they went through a, a seven-game gauntlet where they played playoff teams. It's because the way they really responded after that. And after that, you play teams like the Canadians, teams like the Blackhawks, and you just don't show up. It wasn't like you lost those games. Oh, man, you wish you could have that one back. I mean, it was bad. You lost to the Canadians nine to three, Columbus six to two, Buffalo four to two, Chicago five to one, Montreal five to one, Florida's a good team four to one. But you know, there was a six two loss to Toronto in there, a seven nothing loss to Tampa Bay in there. And I'm sorry, last night, you know, I, I said like I, I saw some guys that were really questioning themselves on the ice. They scored that first goal 65 seconds into the game. I saw guys like trudging over to the to the bench like uh here we go and then the canadians get like three chances with guys wide open in the front of the net okay injuries you got rid of a guy at the trade deadline that you know was one of your better players uh where is your defense sanheim made some silly plays last night uh drysdale who i like and can skate he had one play in the, in, in the first period where he was like went behind the net looked like he was coming out one way look he was coming out another and he just let a defend a guy on the on the Canadians come and, and just steal the puck from him right in the corner. And it was like, what what are you doing here? Very confusing stuff. John brings up so correctly that the power play has been awful all year long. So like that's where it is. I, I wanted to get to that Joanne stuff because I, I was wondering if and I understand when people have feelings come out of emotion. Like, oh my God, this stinks and he's not the coach. I try, I, I, I'm, I try not, not that I try, I'm not like that. And it's probably because of my past profession. I don't jump to conclusions. I can, and I will at certain times, I can look at a player or something and say like, oh, nah, he doesn't belong. No, nah, no, nah, he doesn't belong. He can't have him there. And, and that can happen. But as far as this season has gone for them, for the Flyers, I've been more of a, okay, I see what you're trying to do. I see what you want to do. I see where you've gotten. I see what you have to do to even get to another place, but you didn't do that. So it's been that kind of a season. But but I think the bigger story here today is your Philadelphia 76ers and, and getting that sixth straight win last night and kind of just methodically going about it. But if you look a little deeper, Nick Nurse, he's got something up his sleeve. I, I Something's going on in that head of his. I really wonder what's going on. And a lot of it goes back to this weekend, had a conversation on Kevin Cooney and D-Linem's show with those guys when I jumped on. Is Nick Nurse going to play the old, yeah, you don't know what lineup I'm going to have because I'm going to have a different one pending a matchup against your team. With the Boston Celtics, if you have a matchup with them, I think the biggest thing you need in order to compete is perimeter defense. I think you have to get out there and defend them on the perimeter. Their dribble drives, their shooting. Well, uh, that tells me DeAnthony Melton. You know, that, that says that, that he's going to have to play a big part in that. It also says Tobias Harris. 
I mean, you know, here's a, a guy that's a good defender who can play a guy on a perimeter who is quick enough with 6'9 height to move around. We've seen him on Jason Tatum before do pretty good things. So is that some of the thing that, things that, that um, Nick Nurse is thinking about? Is he looking at, oh, if I play a taller team, yeah, I'm going to go Nick Batum and I'm going to start Joel Embiid and then I'll bring the smaller guys off the bench. Is it a case that he really does see a need, a want, a matchup, one of those three that says, you know what, I need Paul Reed on the floor with Joel Embiid because we've seen it the last few games. And it's like one time you could say, okay, yeah, it's because Tobias Harris wasn't playing. Tobias Harris was there last night, and Paul Reed and, and Joel Embiid were on the floor together again. And he took a nice, long look last night at Buddy Heald on the floor with Joel Embiid, and it was a good thing. He went out and hit five three-pointers. He looked more comfortable to me than he has at any other point in the season. Joel Embiid played a season-high 36 minutes, and I'll tell you what, Ray, it was at the end of his run. There was They were trying to get him out with like five minutes to go, six between five and six minutes to go, and there was no stoppage of play. And Bead gets a rebound, hands it off, and sprints down the floor. There was about four and a half minutes to go, sprinted down the floor looking for the basketball. It meant so much more. You had a huge lead. There's only a few minutes to go in the game. There's somebody at the scorer's table waiting for you to come out. In his mind, he's like, yeah, I got to get in shape. I got to push myself. Thought it was wonderful to see. He almost gets a triple-double for you last night. Just just a good night. Just a very good night. And I think this is getting very interesting with how Nick Nurse is going to move forward with this. A reminder that on Friday, Ray and I and uh, and uh, who do we have? Uh, Amy Fadul. We have Amy Fadul joining us on Friday. We are going to be down at the Sixers practice facility where they are going to unveil a statue of one Allen Iverson. So it should be a fun day down there. We'll try to get a whole bunch of alumni to come on and talk with us. Hopefully AI himself, he'll come over. I already put word out to him. So uh, hopefully we'll be there, good there. But uh, also tomorrow, we promise you a Sixers guest, probably a player, once they're done practice tomorrow. That's what the Sixers have told us. So a lot of great things coming up. A reminder, if you want to talk about any of this, 610-632-0975. After you call, and Mike, I apologize, I owe you a trivia question. After you tell us what you want to talk about, I will give you a trivia question. And if you get it right, you will be in the running to win Dave Matthews tickets. 610-632-0975. This is Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic. The newsmakers are on with Bob Cooney. This team could miss the playoffs and still take huge steps forward where they play.
need to tell you that the 10 o'clock hour is brought to you by Window Nation. Take advantage of Window Nation's 50% off sale on all style windows. Plus, make no down payments with no payments and no interest for 12 full months. Call 866-90-NATION or visit windownation.com. All right, I teased you with this earlier, and at the 11 o'clock hour, we're going to do it because I am amazed at all the little intricacies that have gone on in Philadelphia sports. And the word that I want to relate it to, I don't want to say because it's so negative, but it is amazing. And let's look at it. Okay, it's over. The run's over. Everything's going to be okay from now on. I don't want to put everybody in bad moods or or depression or anything like that, but it has been a crazy 11 months here for Philadelphia sports teams. And I'm going to kind of map it out for you what exactly has gone on with the teams. But uh, last night I, I, I was, I, the Sixers just leave me happy, wondering, uh, curious is probably the best word. I'm not exactly sure what Nick Nurse is doing. Um, I, I, I believe that he knows what he's doing. We can put out there every day until the playoffs because we have fun with it. What would your starting lineup be? Is it against the Celtics? It would be this. But if they play the Bucks, it'll be that. If you play Miami in a play-in game at home, would it be this? Away, would it be that? I wonder if Nick Nurse is thinking along those lines as far as what maybe his lineup, his rotation is going to be come playoff time. So we've talked about Sixers. The Flyers, of course, losing their eight straight. It's just really bad. I, I, I'll be honest. Here's how it went for me last night. Turned them on because they started before the Phillies. 65 seconds into the game, Montreal scores. I go away for a second, come back, boom. I see Montreal go up 2 nothing. I go back to the Sixers, and then on my phone I see it's 3 nothing. Go back, watch a couple minutes at 3 nothing. Turn on the Sixers. I'm keeping an eye on the Sixers and the fly and the Phillies. And then I look up again and it's six nothing. I mean, this has just gotten totally embarrassing. And Tortorella, John Tortorella has used that exact word when talking about this organization right now. It it can't just all be talent or lack thereof. It can't. But I, I, I don't I don't know exactly what it is. It's something deeper than that. Way deeper. Are they just wound down? from the way he ran this ship all year long? I don't know. But on the text line, Ray, we do have somebody that wants to talk about John Tortorella. And what do they have to say? Yeah, Justin Hapro checking in saying, Tortorella was right when he said if people are quitting on him for being hard on his players, then those are not players any of us should want in Philadelphia. Accountability is our thing. Sounds to me we have a locker room of cowards. I don't know if I can go that far. I mean, uh, like John Kincaid brought up a, a really good... Well, he brought up a stat. I don't know how it equates to winning or, or not, but a team that goes and blocks as many shots as this team does, which is a characteristic of a John Tortorella team, that's not easy to do. They're going out there and doing that. They're still doing it somewhat. I, I'm sorry. I, I just saw a lot of – I don't want to say quit. I never say quit on an athlete or, or effort or anything like that, but I don't know. Were guys going 100% last night? Not sure that I saw that. that Lack especially. Of days What's that? Lack of days ago? Uh, disinterested? Yeah, it just, I it's I mean, not pretty. You can pick a word. I like to be careful on the words I pick because I don't. These are professional athletes. They have to do an awful lot to get to the position where they are and to stay where they are. So to call, you know, quit, no effort, I, I, I struggle saying that. But, yeah, there was something last night that I didn't love. And, um... I, I I can't pinpoint it. There probably is something more than I, you know, than we're seeing. Just like with that Eagles team. I still think there was something more. It wasn't just that, uh, I don't know, guys forgot how to play football. Uh, coaches forgot how to coach. Coaches didn't put guys in the best position. I think once it started to go, similar to the Flyers, it snowballs, and you have no confidence in yourself. You have no confidence in your teammates. You have no confidence in your coaches. Perhaps that's one of them. Floyd in Georgia wants to talk about the Sixers lineup. What's up, Floyd? Hey, Bob. How you doing, man? Doing great. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Hey, I miss you and Devon talking this basketball, man. But uh, getting into this Nick Nurse thing, man, it, it seems like he has so much, so many different combinations that he's working on, like even sitting these guys out. It just seems like not even for game to game in the playoffs, it seems like he could 
do different things just for offensive laws. He could bring in different combinations like Buddy Heald and Oubre or Maxi or anything like Tobias Harris. It just seems like he has so many different options that they won't even go through offensive laws because he could switch different things with combinations with Embiid. It seems like that's what he's working on right now. So, Floyd, let me ask you, are you okay with it? Because the way you describe it, it doesn't seem like he's even going game to game or series to series. He might be going minute to minute. Some people could look at that in not a favorable way. Are you looking at it in a favorable way? I'm absolutely looking at it in a favorable way. Yeah, me like, too. You Remember against Boston, we used to have the offensive laws and guys would be standing around and Harden's holding the ball. It seems like now if we go through an offensive law for two minutes, he could switch the lineup. And they still would be able to work together because they've been working with so many different lineups this year. That And he seems like he's smart enough to just be able to have a set perfect for yeah. every lineup. All right, so let me ask you this, Floyd. What would be your ultimate starting lineup to throw out in a playoff game no matter the opponent? Who would you like to see out there? See, that part you threw in with no matter the opponent made it tough. <laughs> okay, okay. So you are, you are of the gist, definitely. It, he's going to match up. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And that's not just game to game or series to series. This is quarter to quarter. You know, depending on how the offense is looking, who's out there, how they're trying to defend and be, and how he can run off of it. You know, you got the backdoor cuts, you got this, the flare out, you got the screens where you're coming across. Like, it seems like no matter what defense they throw at him, he has an offense that could counter that, which uh, is incredible to me. All right, fair enough. Now, uh, Floyd, I know you're, you, I can't put you up for these tickets to the Dave Matthews because I don't think you're going to be up here. No. You're down in Georgia, right? <laughs> But I'll give yeah, you a right. trivia question anyway, real quick. Okay. Former Sixers coach Doug Collins went into the Hall of Fame this past weekend. Name me another former Sixers coach that is in the Hall of Fame. Wow, another former Sixers coach in the Hall of Fame. Larry Brown? Larry Brown, that's exactly right. Way to go, Floyd. If you were uh, up here, I'd give you some George Matthews or being a chance. But, Floyd, thanks for the call. Appreciate it. Larry Brown, the other day. When I was getting, when this thought came to mind, I believe it was Sunday, I said to my wife, I said, here's, I'm going to do a trivia thing, I think on Wednesday, I got to talk to Ray about it, blah, blah, blah. She goes, all right, give me one. I said, okay. Doug Collins just got, you know, in inducted into the Hall of Fame and, it, and all that. And give me another Sixers coach. She goes, Larry Brown. Pretty wow. impressive, huh? That is impressive. How about you? Can you give why me one? Why did Mo Cheeks come to my mind? Ah, uh, there you go. That's true. That was the one that, I don't know why that was the first one that jumped to my mind, but that was the one I had. Mo Cheeks, Billy Cunningham. Yeah, there's a... Yeah, I, I'm just saying of the working backwards, I would think Larry Brown, especially do, going to the AI uh, sculpture reveal this Friday, you would think Larry Brown's more top of mind for me than, than Mo Cheeks I, as a coach for the 76ers. But I hope there he's am. there. I hope he's there because uh, I, I just think that dynamic was so cool. It was too totally different people and i was lucky enough to went through i was at the daily news at the time it was just such a great dynamic okay when we get back i do want to go bit by bit over this last 11 months just to see what's going on here mike in the cell we'll get to you anybody else 610-632-0975 a lot of things on the table we'd love to hear from you either call or text that number this is middays bob cooney 97.5 the fanatic Six in a row for the Sixers. I'm Ray Dunn. This update.
done. Taking you through middays here on this hump day Wednesday. A lot to talk about. We've been talking a lot of Sixers. You have to talk about the collapse of the Flyers. Where exactly is this team? I just had a text, Ray, from a friend during the break. Look, this is just a text from a Philadelphia sports fan who, a friend of mine, I just wanted to put it out there. Players are not dumb. They can't get rid of everyone. Tortorella is not the right coach. They quit on him. And they will win to get rid of him. If not this year, it will be next. Did they quit? I don't. Did they quit? John John brought up a, a, a great line that, you know, I don't know if teams that quit on a coach that are still going down and blocking as many shots as the Flyers do every game. But I didn't see a whole lot of um, interest there last night, particularly when they got down early. I don't know. I, I, I That's a hard thing to say, that they've lost interest. I mean, I'm sorry, that they've quit on him. I don't want to go there. But I, I wanted to read the text because that is a Philadelphia fan. It's just like all of you wonderful people on our YouTube channel, all of you great people that, that will either tweet into us, text into us, whatever, call into us. Uh, it's, it's something to be said. So I want to go to Mike on the cell, has something on the Sixers. And Mike, get ready for your trivia question. Mike, you're on 97.5 The Fanatic. What's going on? Uh, thanks for taking my call. How you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? I used to be on ESPN Radio myself in 04. I had my own show in the Lehigh Valley. Oh, yeah, nice. Mike the fan. Anyway, the Sixers. I'll call into you then one of these days. <laughs> oh, no, no, it was 2004. I spent a half a million dollars in the city. I had a suite next to Mayor Street. I had club boxes in the Sixers games. I went to all the concerts the Wells Fargo Center. Well, it was Wachovia back then. But those was, those days are long ago. That was 20-some years ago. Oh, okay. Anyway, <laughs> um, the Sixers, if they're Embiid, then at least it's the beast they can be. They can beat anybody the way they're playing. You know what I mean? I, I'll tell you what. They're, they're the scariest team in the playoffs yeah, with are. the unknown of what is what is this team with Joel Embiid. Well, with him being out two months, they, he's a lot to prove, and he, he wants to prove the doubters wrong, who said he wouldn't come back, and if he came back, he wasn't going to be himself. He's doing fine. I love it. I feel bad for the Flyers. When they were in the sixth spot, I was getting excited. Now, I'm not a big hockey guy. I've only been to a couple games. I don't know a lot about the rules. I like watching the fights and the action. But um, I feel bad for the fans. It's unfortunate what's happened to them at Philadelphia. It happens. Yeah, it sure does. All right, Mike, you want me to give you a chance to go see Dave Matthews? Well, yeah, but let me ask you, where's the Iverson thing? When, when and where's the Iverson thing? That's on Friday. It's at yeah. the uh, practice complex over in Camden. I don't know. You have to look it up, Mike. I don't know right. if it's open to the public, whatever it may be. So check it oh. out. But we're going to be broadcasting from there. All right, what's your trivia question? All right, you ready? Yes, sir. Who is the all-time leader in assists and steals for your Philadelphia 76ers? Oh, no. Um, wow. You got to go way back, and I can't. Assists and steals. Uh-huh. Well, it's got to be one of the guards. His name was just mentioned on this radio station within the last half hour. Well, I was unfortunately in the Power 99, which I blew off. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I... I... The Sixers guys, I can't remember any. I, you know, all right. I the Sixers he's in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I wore, all right, Mike, thanks for the call, buddy. I wore his number because he's my favorite player of all time. It's Mo Cheeks. That would be one Maurice Cheeks correct. Okay, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer. I'm not doing that. This is more of a, and this is the way I look at things, more of a, holy cow, look at that. That is a little bit nuts. Okay, we're going to go back to November of 2022 and father sean has checked in he's got some other obligations going on right now but he will get in touch with us because we are going to need a blessing or an exorcism i'm not sure i don't want to be disrespectful we're going to need something to change the 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 way the sports gods are looking down upon philadelphia especially over the last 11 months why because here i am going to give you the reason It is November of 2022, and the Phillies have a 2-1 to lead in the World Series. They get no hit in Game 4 to tie it 2-2. to They lose the next two games and go down to the Houston Astros in what was a wonderful season. No doubt about it. It was terrific. But if you remember, the game before they got no hit, 
They hit four home runs. They scored seven runs. They won seven to nothing. All of a sudden, boom, no hit. They lose three in a row. They don't win the World Series. Let's move ahead just a couple of days. A couple of days. Actually, it was during this collapse of the Phillies in the World Series. Your Philadelphia Union are in the MLS Championship at Los Angeles Football Club. They are ahead 3-2 to two in extra time. There are seconds to go. And because of a red card, the Union are up one man. The Union are on a power play, if you want to equate it to hockey. They give up a goal in the last seconds. That ties the game at 3-3, and then they lose the shootout in overtime. That was literally a championship that was in your hands that melted right through it because of that. Let's forward ourselves just a couple of months from November to February. The Eagles in February of 2023 have a 10-point halftime lead against the Kansas City Chiefs. We watched Patrick Mahomes limp off the field as if he was playing on one leg. And what happens? The Eagles get outscored 24-11 to in the second half. They lose 38-35. to Jalen Hurts has an incredible game, but somehow fumbles with no one around him. And the Eagles wind up losing that game in heartbreak fashion. Move ahead just a few months to May of 2023, and we're talking game six to the Boston Celtics at the Wells Fargo Center. Series is tied 2-2. Two to two. The Sixers hold an 83-81 lead with just under five minutes to go. They get outscored 14-3 to three the rest of the way. They lose to the Boston Celtics in that game. Then they go to Boston and get shellacked. They lose game seven, 112 to 88. There goes a chance for the Sixers to go past the second round when it seemed right there for them. Move up to October of 2023. The Phillies are up three to two in Arizona against the Diamondbacks in the National League Championship Series. They lose three in a row. They lose at Arizona. They come home and lose two more, and they don't go to the World Series. Arizona does. Phillies had a chance to go to two straight World Series, one of the bigger collapse you'll ever see from a Phillies team. That happened in October of 23. Let's go to the end of 2023, beginning of 2024. Your Philadelphia Eagles are 10-1. and one. They lose six out of their last seven. They wind up going to Tampa Bay to play a playoff game against Baker Mayfield. And they get their doors blown off. Inexplicable. To this day, I still think there's more to it than what happened. We don't know. I don't know. You don't know. Is it, it couldn't have been talent. They have a lot of talent there, a lot of pro bowlers. There was something that went on with that team that went from 10-1 and one to losing six out of the last seven. We call it the biggest collapse maybe in Philadelphia sports history, definitely from the Philadelphia Eagles. And then you go currently, your Philadelphia Flyers. And while expectations before this season started were not anything but looking to rebuild, looking to grow this organization, I'm sorry, but you spent 124 days in playoff talk. 124 days you were in the playoffs had the season ended then. And then you come out and you lose nine of your last 11. And you get down 6 nothing last night, a must-game win to the Montreal Canadiens, who aren't a very good team. And you lose that game 9-3. to three. And you appear, your head coach said it was an embarrassment. The jersey was embarrassed by your play just a week earlier. So you have all those things going on with the Flyers. It looks like they're not going to make the playoffs. Has this season been a success? I, I labeled it out two weeks ago. I said, man, if they go on this decline, and while they had a really good two-thirds of the season, it doesn't come out being good. Uh, you, you have some draft picks. You traded away some things. Michkov is coming. That's all great. Did you find some players this year to grow with? Did this ending of the season make John Tortorella, Keith Jones, Danny Briere look differently at players as a group, as individuals, than they did the ones that got them to the 124 days in playoff position? Could be. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I can turn this season a success. 
I think there were some good things that they probably got out of it, but there probably wasn't enough that they got out of it when they were in the position that they were in. So that's why I say, uh, Father Sean, I'm sorry. Those are seven examples of just horridness. Like, that's horrible, all these bad things that have happened to Philadelphia. So I, I, I don't know if we call it an exorcism or if we just need a blessing. As I said, I don't want to be disrespectful here, but Father Sean is on the line, and he's going to have to lend us some help. Father Sean, how are you today, buddy? Hey, Bobby, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks. That's, that's a pretty bad run of sporting events that we've had over the last 11 months. Yeah, you're right, but... You and I are about the same age, and we grew up with a lot of bad stuff, too, back in the day. So we've had our share, Father Sean. We don't need any more. I know. <laughs> so what do we do? What, what, what can I get you to do to help out the, the, the sports world in, here in Philadelphia? Is it just you can talk privately to the sports gods for us? Do you throw nah, a blessing? Nah, nah, well, how does nah, it work? Nah. Wait a minute, Bobby. Now, when you go sports gods... I'm out on that because I know it's all fun and games and that, but, you know, we I, only believe in a one God, you know. I said I didn't want to be disrespectful at all, but when it comes yeah. to maybe throwing a blessing on our sports teams, I knew nobody higher to go to than you. Prepare to well, up. here's the thing. Uh, we can certainly do that and pray for the, the players and the teams and maybe, uh, I don't know, go down and bless all the bats for the Phillies and uh, – <laughs> You know, you know, and all the players and that, and uh, the Sixers, and, and bless them, beads knee, and all that. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line is, is uh, you know, I think if you're, if you're, I know you're a great dad, and if you think about it, like as a dad. Sorry about that, my. Uh, That's all right. We know you're going straight to heaven. No, <laughs> I need prayers too, pal. <laughs> but anyway, uh, round recalculation. So here's the thing: if we were to, uh, if if we compare it to like, say, say you had your two boys on team, and maybe this maybe this actually happened to you. If you had your one son on one team and your other son on another team, and they were playing against each other, what do you do as a dad? You can't root for one against the other. So no, that's count. That's kind of how it is because, you know, the other teams are praying, too, that they win. And uh, God doesn't play any favorites, in other words. But, I got you on that. But what we can do, though, Bobby, is this. Now, you were talking about the Flyers and how they seem to have become disinterested, however you want to phrase that. Uh, we can, you know, pray for the players to do their best and to give all that they can because that's what, you know, you know we got to look at it this way. Sports is something that is a gift from God. It's something that we, you know, give thanks to him for. We don't want it to replace religion, um, but it's something that is a good thing. And It's our escape, right, Father? Well, not only that, but anytime you compete, you know, we're trying to use the best of our abilities for something, uh, and that's always something good, you know? You're correct. Uh, as, long as, as long as we do it with sportsmanship and, and with, and, you know, the right way and all that, so praying for our players that they play the best that they can, playing for our coaches the best that they can, and all that kind of thing. But I understand because it's like we have been through a lot, and yet think of it this way. Where would we be if all of our teams were like, you know, in, a, in like the fifth place or something like that? And we've been through that as a city before, as we said earlier. Yeah, no, Maybe. you're right. You're absolutely right, Father Sean. I'm sorry. I got to run here. I appreciate the call okay, in. Buddy. I hope your day's going great. Much appreciated. Uh, uh, Father Sean was a little, you know, a little skeptical. I didn't want to throw down a prayer because, like I said, I don't want to be, I don't want to be um, uh, disrespectful. Uh, but I was just kind of hoping for, uh, you know, God bless. Maybe, maybe, maybe the sports gods just stop, stop picking on us. It's just not good, Ray. It's not good. I don't like it. I should have given Father Sean a trivia question, but I don't think he's a Dave Matthews fan. I think he's more of a Springsteen guy. I think we've had that conversation before. Why are you looking at me in, like, disbelief? Nothing. I'm not looking at you in disbelief. I I'm pretty it's, sure it's... that I was having a beer with Father Sean at one of our uh, P.J. Wellahan's gatherings, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure somehow the topic came up that we kind of like some of the same music. Springsteen came up. Eh, you know, to 
interest. That's with you? Kinda, you yeah, know, no, I'm, common just, interests yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, kind of shocked by that. The the idea that it's bad is true. It's been brutal to have these collapses. But it's funny because it reminds me of the conversation that Andrew and I had a couple weeks, maybe a couple months at this point. I don't know. It, at some point during this grand old thing we call life, we talked about whether it's been the, the good old days, whether we'll look back and, you know, at some point we'll pine for these days. I think that's where Father Sean's going with this. Like, it, you could have the Phillies, it's, you know, oh, we're going into a season expected to win 70 games. You could go into a season expecting, you know, the Eagles to, oh, well, you know, if they could just make the playoffs. Like, Part of our reason, part of the reason our hearts have been broken, is because the expectations have been raised, and that's the wild thing about this Flyers th- team. Because y- you can't just let them off the hook with uh, the expectations in October. No, we're not to be here. I, that that's where I, I can't go to today. I can't go to this t- today. I think there are some people that are you know doing like backflips to try and uh, defend Torts. Excuse me, John Tortorella. I, I'm sorry, I didn't want to use. You can too. say it. I just, it just, I don't know why it. it yeah, puts a it bothers you. Yeah, I understand. But no, that's fine. No, it's all right. I, listen, Bob, I'm here for you. Okay, I'm here <laughs> to help you out. Um, I, I don't understand why people are doing that. I also don't understand why people are. If this was any other team in this city, we would be livid. You should be upset today. You should be upset with what they put forth, especially nine to three. Nine to three against the Canadians. Horrible. I mean, that's a disaster. Look, go back to your expectations before the beginning of the season. I didn't expect the, the Flyers to go 2-11 and 11 over 11, over 13-game spans. I expected them to be, hopefully they're a 500 team. No, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs, whatever. You got to the part that you got to. Your expectations have to change. I, I, I'm sorry, they do. All they had to do was be mediocre over the last 14, 15 games of the season. Mediocrity. That's all you needed. And you didn't come close to that. We're talking nine to three to the Canadians. We're talking blowouts to other teams, Columbus and all the likes of that. Like it's not, a, it can't be acceptable, and you can't say you expected it. Grand scheme, when the season gets over and they didn't make the playoffs, and you say, yeah, okay, before the season you didn't expect them to make the playoffs, and they didn't. What are the positives? What are the negatives? Positives are, you know, Owen Tippett, Forster, uh, Bobby Brink. Frost, maybe those are some guys that you can grow into being good NHL players, whatever. The negatives, my God, does, does the last part of, does the last 20 games of this season, does that outshine everything else that went on this season? That's the question. The question was posed of, oh, we're going to, not even the question, but the idea was posed of, we're going to find out who we've got here and who can stick up for, for big time hockey, who can get ready to get us into the postseason. They well, started talking about the playoffs. This is not something that we just start talking out of thin air. This was something that the organization, that's something that Tortorella for sure was talking about that, okay, we're going to find out who can play in big moments, who can get us into the postseason. He mentioned the playoffs for the first time. He started talking about he wanted to get these experiences because he thinks it's big for these guys. This was supposed to be a big stretch to show who you had and show what you had going forward. And what you got was disgusting. Yeah. So, you know, there's all that that we have on the table. It's disgusting in the Flyers. I, I, basically, I guess it comes down to 60 games of goodness, of, of really goodness. Does that overshadow? Is that what you should concentrate on more than the collapse of the last 20 games? Because isn't the last 20 games when you need to get wins and ties and better play? Isn't that what you're more judging your players on? than the first 60 games of the season? You know, that's the legitimate question out there. Also with the Sixers, I, I'm reading our YouTube page, and I love our YouTube people. I, I, it's like a family. It's really cool to read these guys. I, there's a lot of optimism with this Sixers team right now. And false hope, or, or what are we looking at? I just think there's a lot going on there. So uh, we can talk about that. We can talk about a whole lot of things. Don't forget, I'll throw you a trivia question after you call in to talk to somebody. It'll put you in the running for Dave Matthews tickets. We can do that. Uh, Phillies, Flyers, Sixers. Not much going on with the Eagles. We heard Adam Schefter this morning. Maybe we'll dip into that a little bit more. But 12 o'clock, Matt Breen is going to join us to talk about everything that's going on in the sports world here in Philadelphia. And then Barrett Brooks is going to join us because I wanted to talk to somebody that's been in close with the Eagles for a while and talk about exactly what this Fe- uh, Fletcher Cox retirement, what's it mean off the field, on the field, Are we kind of like giving a free pass to the Eagles of, oh, yeah, you just lost two Hall of Famers?
no big deal. We'll talk about all that a whole lot more. Bob Cooney, 97.5, The Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. 76ers keep rolling. I'm Ray Dunn. This update is brought to you by Brad.
5thefanatic.com. Hey, welcome back, or thanks for joining us here on a Wednesday, 11.30 here at 97.5 The Fanatic. 11 o'clock hour, it's brought to you by Golden Nugget Jewelers, where Philly gets engaged. All right, we did have some breaking news this morning. As far as your Philadelphia Eagles go, and it was pretty fun because, you know, breaking news is like what it's all about in the in the media business, right, Ray? You know, like when I was a beat writer, if I got some breaking news, it was awesome. Couldn't wait to verify it, run with it, have it out there before anybody else. Well, this morning, guess what? That happened with our own Haley. So I'm sitting out. You and I were both, I believe you were in, we're both sitting at the, out, out there doing our prep work, and it comes over X from Adam Schefter, breaking news that the Philadelphia Eagles will be facing in Brazil on Friday, September 8th. I think that's the date. The Green Bay Packers. Well, Haley sees it, and she runs like, like she was doing a 40-yard dash. She runs into the studio to let everybody know, breaking news, breaking news, breaking news. So we broke it this morning on the Kincaid and Salchuna show. You're not happy. What no. is See, I, why? You, all right, uh, before you go. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So we hear it. Ray gets up from his desk and kicks an imaginary ball, throws a pen back on the desk, slams his chair up against the desk. Now, none of this is as violent as I make it sound, but all of these things did happen. And, and I just turn, I go, Ray, I, I, it was, I felt like I was at home and one of my kids was upset about something. I said, Ray, w what are you doing? What's wrong? This isn't about you. What, what's the problem? Your problem is? Well, I have a multitude of them. But the one with this <laughs> I'm one talking specifically. About just concerning this game. Yes, specifically with this game, there is my own personal problem where I was actually going to invest money into going to an Eagles game because I was excited for the Packers to be in town. I wanted to see Jordan Love in person. I understand that Bill yesterday had his thoughts on Jordan Love. I bit my tongue in here, okay? I did not like the fact that he was already doubting Jordan Love. It sounded a little bit like he was hating on the guy. Jordan Love's the real deal. I was excited to go watch him play football in a game that I thought was going to be Pretty awesome. Packers, Eagles in Philadelphia. I was looking forward to that. I wanted that. Now, aside from my own personal feelings on the matter, my own personal feelings on the fact that I wanted to go watch Jordan Love at Lincoln Financial Field, there is also the fact that Brazil, right now the most popular team there, according to the NFL's own data, is the Green Bay Packers. 12% of the population in Brazil are Green Bay fans. And you say, oh, how do you know that? That's NFL Brazil. That's what they've come up with. Also, the colors for Brazil are the same colors as the Green Bay Packers, which might have a little bit of correlation right there. Where is this game being played? Brazil. Are they giving the Eagles one of their home games against the most popular team in Brazil? Yes, that is exactly what they're doing. And on top of that, we had that conversation the first day of this program, all the way back when we started this show so long ago, Ryan Westbrook hopped on. Ryan Westbrook said what? What was the big takeaway we had from that wonderful conversation we had? In him? order for the Eagles to forget about the collapse of last year, they had to get off to a good start this year. And you tell me that the Green Bay Packers, the Green Bay Packers who had a worse record but got further than the Philadelphia Eagles and had, you know, Brock Purdy not conjured up some of that craziness that he somehow, you know, manages to win games despite playing poorly. Packers legitimately had a path to the NFC Championship game this season. Now, the Eagles are going to open up against that Packers team in a game that's supposed to be one of their home games, yet they're going to be playing the most popular team in the country they're going to play to open up a season where we said they have to get off to a hot start. Take my own personal bias of wanting to see Jordan Love in person play aside, and I don't like the spot for the Philadelphia Eagles already. And it's only April, what, 10th? Yeah, I don't like it. How many true blue sports, how many true blue world soccer fans do we have in philadelphia i don't know not many how many of that of those people if i told you 12 percent are in love with the columbia soccer team and they're giving them a game here oh my god what an unbelievable advantage nah sorry i'll guarantee you almost that there's going to be more eagles fans at that stadium that night against the packers than they're going to be packers fans 12 percent of what? All NFL fans that live in Brazil are Packers fans? Yep. That's probably the biggest babyish thing you've ever said on this show. Uh, probably. I mean, it's a young show. 12% of all the... 
<laughs> so if there's 100 football fans, 12 of them uh, are going to be there okay, cheering their asses off for the Packers. Look at uh, what if the Eagles are at 8%? So they're going to have four more people just in that fan base there. Four times 70,000? That's not, but that, you're going to have people from Philadelphia. You know there, how many thousands of people be, from Philly people are going to go to that game? It's a tough game to get down to. You fly. How's it tough? It's Brazil. It's not exactly around the corner. Yeah, I, I know people, people are going to travel, but it's not like this is the, the easiest game to, to get Germany to. People Germany when the Eagles played there. Did they play in Germany? When the Germans bombed Pearl Harbor. Yeah. <laughs> no, did the Eagles, where did they play? Was it London or Germany? I don't know, Bob. Oh, what this is your there was, there was plenty of Eagles fans there. Eagles fans travel. The Eagles fans will get there. Packers, it's not like they have a, a docile fan base. This is not a fan base that's just like, oh, yeah, we kind of care about the team. So they wear a, cheese on their head. It's They're a disadvantage lunatics. that a Brazilian is going to wake up on that September morning and say, hmm, am I going to wear my green Brazilian soccer shirt or my yellow one? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the colors of the Packers, too. Disadvantage Eagles. Disadvantage Eagles. You're being They're a baby. Most, They're the most popular team in Brazil, Bob. That's science. 12% of a population Bob, that might be only country. 100 people. Would you think 12% of America are Eagles fans? No, 12%. But that's many, a whole country. I'm not talking about a locality. I'm talking about a whole country. How many football fans do you think are in that country? American football fans are in Brazil. I think you'd be Brazil. surprised, considering we talk about all the time. Wow, look at the way they're growing the game. The game's massive. It's the biggest sporting event going on. I think they have a legitimate football fan base down there. They wouldn't be going to Brazil if they didn't think they could, they could sell out the place. Oh, of course, of course. It's an event. It doesn't mean that those are dire. We had 75,000 people go to, uh, you know, World Cup scrimmage games or whatever they were. This was here. the year we were supposed to have nine home games. How many people traveled? Oh, okay, I'll go with you on that, that you're disappointed because you wanted to see the Packers. Yes. I'll give you that. But when you're talking about colors and people's drawers of shirts and stuff, I'm sorry, I think you're reaching a little bit, Ray. I'm just I guarantee saying, the Eagles you, will have more people there than the Packers. You were given, this is one of your home games. This is one of your designated home games. I'm fine with them playing at a neutral site. I was, again, I was team eight away, eight home, one neutral site. That, that, that was the way I would break up a 17-game schedule if you wanted to have it. But while we have these rules, everyone else is going to get, that is supposed to get nine home games, gets their nine home games. The Eagles are going to play one of their home games in a country where the most popular team in that country is their opponent. Okay. You're, you, I th I'm, I'm sorry. No disrespect. Love you to death. I think you're reaching a little bit there. I'll go uh, with the... Fine. I'll go with the you're upset because you wanted to see Jordan Love. That's fine. Let's leave it at that. I don't you think we got to go that. to the 12%, the I'd... most percentage. Did they break down percentage? Like, where did the Eagles fall? Were they 11%? I'll get NFL Brazil on the phone. <laughs> we'll break it down. You we'll better get an interpreter. <laughs> you're not going to. So, Luis Cortez on our YouTube page says, come on, Bob and Ray, get in the game. The Eagles game was at London. I don't know why I had Germany in my head, but it was at London. I do remember watching the game against Jacksonville. Um, so Brazil, I told you, Ray, I want you to be happy because of you being so upset. You are now invited over to the house. I told Ray that on that Friday night, it's going to be a September night. It's probably going to be nice and warm. My pool in the backyard will still be open. We are planning on having a lot of food, the TV out in the backyard, all of that. Ray, I'm going to give you your own floaty, everything. You're going to, I'll feed you beers all night. You can have a good time at this game. I don't want to see you upset i don't want to see you at my house floating in the pool and saying oh my god listen to all those brazilians the 12 percent that love the packers this is so unfair I i'm just trying to make you happy right what the hell are you looking up so diligently in there you're looking up I'm to see what to percentage of brazilians like you're an idiot oh, i don't know what you're talking i'll about. be there for you i'll be there hanging out with you bob we just could watch the play literally anyone else that friday night as well okay all right, if you so say okay, so. Okay, but wait, you, did, you didn't get to the, the whole point of uh, the hot start. You you did you got very fixated on the whole 12.3%. I, I kind of did, but go ahead. What are you going to No, I just mean the hot start. That, like, it's a good team to start the season. You have to start the season against someone. I understand that. I just, you know, Packers, Eagles. I, I don't know. I, I The Friday night thing has also been bothering me. I think I'm just kind of bothered. I wish they were I, just doing this one a Sunday, uh, you know, just normal. I hear you. And that's, that's usually how I am, right? But if you're going to do something, I look for the, okay, what's the benefit? Um, I, I think it's pretty cool. Like I said, and this is so selfish. A Friday night at 6 o'clock, it's going to be warm weather here probably. Hopefully it's beautiful. 
uh, I, I'm lucky enough that my father-in-law gave us money to get a pool. We have a pool in the backyard that I want to be sitting in, that I want to have friends over, and I want to have a TV that I'll bring outside, and we can make a night of it and have fun with it. I'm looking at it that way, that if this has to happen, and look, people out there that are listening to us now, I can't imagine the plans people have for a Friday night in September to watch an Eagles game after you get done work. And you don't have anything to do the next day. Because usually if you're watching an Eagles game nighttime, prime time, you have work the next day. Because it's either, it's either Thursday, Sunday, or Monday. Now you got a Friday night game, right? It's going to be awesome. Come on, I'm going to get you out of these doldrums. Not only before the game, I'm going to get you out of the doldrums before today is over. Before we leave this show, you're going to be happy that the Eagles, Friday night, Green Bay Packers, somehow, some way. We'll do it. All right, reminder, Matt Breen's going to join us at 12 o'clock, talk everything Philadelphia sports. He had some interesting tidbits on. He was going down to the um, uh, WrestleMania this past weekend, so I'm sure he'll have some good stories there. At 1 o'clock, Barrett Brooks is going to join us to talk about Philadelphia Eagles. He had the retirement of uh, Fletcher Cox yesterday, so we'll get in on that. If you want to talk about anything, 610-632-0975 will give you a chance to win a pair of Dave Matthew tickets. If you bring up a good sports point, then I'll give you a good trivia question after that. They're not too hard. You should be able to get them. I thought the last one who leads the Sixers in assists all time and steals, Maurice Cheeks, thought that was gettable. 610-632-0975. This is Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic. Philadelphia Eagles defensive tackle Fletcher Cox. Playing in Philly's got to have thick skin, especially being drafted in the first round. To the city of Philadelphia, I thank you a whole lot. You heard his retirement press conference live. When people look back at my career, the biggest thing is I want them to look at the way that I played the game, the honest way I played the game, the way that they looked at my leadership. What's next for the birds? The latest developments are here. Philadelphia sports station for breaking news. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97. 5 thefanaticcom Ricky Bo here and buying MLB tickets just got
about it. Today's a pretty good day in the golf world because it's the par three contest at the Masters. Uh, for those who are golf fans, you know what it's all about. Their families get out there. They skip balls off the water. It's a lot of fun. You get like Jack Nicholas out there and then, you know, some old guys in a threesome and stuff like that. It's a fun day. I love the Masters. I run a Masters pool here at the office that I put together myself. Uh, we have quite a few contestants in so far. Ray just gave me his. Uh, I like the Masters. I do. And there's a lot of people out there that aren't golf fans. I understand that, too. And, and that's part of this conversation. I'm not here to say, like, I can't believe you don't like the Masters. If you know me, I, I'm cool with whatever you like. I'm cool that you don't like stuff I don't like. I'm not one of those guys that cares about you hating on something that I like and vice versa. That's okay. That, that's what makes us all different. That's cool. I'll ask the people, because I love the Masters, but I can understand how it gets on people's nerves. And it, there's something about the Masters that gets on my nerves. And I brought it up before, but I'll tell you, those of you who haven't heard again, I can't stand that I'm watching the Super Bowl on, like, February 4th or something like that. Or I'm watching a Rose Bowl game or whatever game it is in early January or sometime in December. And I get, coming in April, the Masters. Uh, okay. It comes every, I know. I don't need to hear that in January, in February. I hope something they start playing it in July. Till the second week of April. No, like, see, this is, maybe it's an age thing, right? As I'm getting older, and you, <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't even say that with a straight face because I still feel like I'm 20 years old, and I know I acted too. But I guess you become more appreciative of time as you get older. Like, you can't just waste time and say, oh, I just want the summer to be over so football can begin. No, I love the summer. Like, I want to enjoy every day. So I can't have it in January, the coming in April, the Masters. April, it's January. Can I just get through, like, the rest of the football playoffs? Can I get through the beginning of hockey season and basketball season and March Madness and all of that stuff? Can you let me just have my time before we rush into something that's three months away? That bothers me about the Masters. And don't look at me like that. I'm sorry. I just spent 15 minutes being told that I'm complaining about something nonsensical. That's and you're complaining point. that the commercial in front of you for five seconds with a beautiful scenic shot of probably the 16th green or something is you being like oh wow that's a waste of my time what would you rather them sell you something else in that commercial spot they're just telling you in april you should get excited for some golf that's what's bothering you about the masters yeah it bothers me i don't need to see commercials in january when i'm dead set on football playoffs college football college basketball everything I you don't have to remind me something. That, that's like my wife telling me, and God, I love her to death. But that's like my l wife on, on a Sunday. She'll she'll plan out dinners until Friday or Thursday because Friday we usually order out. So then on, on like, Monday, she might ask me what's for dinner on Thursday, and I'm like, I, I don't know. Like, I don't remember that from a week ago. You have to remind me. I know the Masters is in April. You don't have to remind me in the middle of a professional football playoff game the Masters is coming in April. Would you rather them sell you me. body spray? Like, what? it's the commercial spot. It bothers spot. me. It's like five seconds, and Maybe Bob. I need new body spray. Maybe the last one I had a reaction to. And I say, oh, oh, okay, let me get off of the axe. And let me try that. <laughs> let me try that new body spray. Yeah, that's informative. That's something that I need right then and there, maybe. I hope they play the commercial during the Eagles-Packers game in September. I hope you have now to be you're reminded. Now you're just being silly now. I, I am. You want to know why I am? Because it's such a ridiculous thing to be bothered about the Masters. I, it's, it's, it, it, like, it, look, it doesn't carry over to, oh, my God. Again. But it does. I, when I look at that, I go, really? Really? In January, you got to tell me that the Masters is coming on in April? I walk into Target in August, and they're already selling me Halloween candy. I think they could sell me the Masters in January. You know what else I don't like about the Masters? Why do they make the caddies wear those white overall things, whatever they call them? They're so ugly. It's so stupid. You're kind of just like, oh, you're a caddy? You get one of these ugly white outfits. I don't like them. All right. I don't like I think, them, right? I, I think we can agree on that one. That's pretty dumb. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you don't like about the Masters? I do, here's what I do love about the Masters. If you ever, and Ray and I both said during one of the breaks that it is on our bucket list. 
You look at the price. Have you seen the prices of things that they sell inside the ropes at the Masters? I think I've seen it come up before. Beers are the most expensive things there. Now, we're talking the Masters. You're thinking prestigious, money, all this stuff. The most expensive thing to buy when you're inside the ropes at the Masters is an imported beer for $3.50. You can get, like, ham and cheese sandwiches for a buck fifty. The what is it? The pimento and olive or whatever sandwich is popular down there. I know Mike Kern yelling at me right now, but those are like a dollar fifty. Well, you can eat and drink all day for twenty bucks, and you're good to go. So that's the great thing about the Masters. Besides it being Master Sunday is one of my favorite days ever uh, of the sports calendar year. It is. It's one of my favorite days. I look up the weather all the week before. So that's how much I love the Masters, and I love watching it. You're telling me you're looking up the weather the week before, but you can't remember what's for dinner on Thursday on Monday? I, but that's not, like, I, I know I'm going to eat, and, like, you know, I know. You know they're going to try and play the Masters, Bob. I also know it's in April. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I don't you need don't... to be told in January that it's coming up in April. I think you do. I, think I don't you think do. so. I think you're wrong. Uh, one of the things, we're going to talk to Matt Breen at noon, but one of the things I want to bring up to him, and, Ray, I'm going to ask you this before we hit a break real quick. Do you think the Phillies have a problem hitting in the clutch? So we can go back to, and I talked about the collapses of all the teams over the last uh, 14 months, I believe it was, or 16 months, somebody corrected me, uh, of the Philadelphia teams. We talk about Castellanos and, and who was it, a couple of other guys, when it combined like 0 for 36 against the Diamondbacks to finish that series. We saw them get no hit up two games to one, against the Houston Astros and then lose the next three games and lose that series in six. Ray, is it a serious problem that this team doesn't hit in the clutch or is this just circumstantial? I mean, I think this is circumstantial for this moment. I think we're prisoners of the moment right now for the way this season started. I think last year they started not hitting with runners in scoring position, and I don't think they ended up in uh, tremendous, like, you know, top five of the league in it. But I think right now we're, we're prisoners of this moment of, wow, they have really not hit with runners in scoring position um, yeah, I think that it's bigger concern because you remember how it ended last season. You sit here like, ooh, the same things that plagued that team down the stretch are still very evident here. Yeah. But the things that put them in that position are still also very evident with this squad. It's a talking point. It sure is a talking point. All right, when we get back, we're going to talk to Matt Breen at noon. Also, a chance to win $1,000 at noon. And I also want to hit on what are your expectations maybe have they changed with the Philadelphia 76ers? This is Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5, The Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. The 76ers keep rolling. I'm Ray Dunn. This update is brought to you by Juicy Juice. Juicy Juice is 100% juice, which means no sugar added and no artificial.
bonus. That's right. Now's your chance to win $1,000. Here's what you have to do. Text the word PRIZE, P-R-I-Z-E, PRIZE, to 45911. Or you can enter it on the Fanatic app or at 975thefanatic.com. One winner will be selected at random and will win $1,000 in this company-wide contest. Winners will get a call from Beasley, so be sure to answer your phone. Complete rules at 975thefanatic.com. 97.5 The Fanatic signing bonus is presented by Rand Spear. The accident lawyer demand Rand for justice. Please don't ever text and drive, and good luck. This is Philadelphia's sports station for breaking news. Now, more with Bob Cooney. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5thefanatic.com. Welcome back to The Fanatic as we approach the noon hour. We appreciate you being here with us. Philadelphia Phillies play this afternoon against the St. Louis Cardinals. Other than that, I don't know if I'm even going to count on the Flyers for the rest of the season for anything, but you got Sixers Friday night, Sixers on Sunday, a lot to look at there. A lot to talk about on the Comcast Business Hotline with our friend Matt Breen. Matt, welcome to the show. How you doing today, buddy? I'm good, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Look at that. They're even giving you music as you come on, Matt. <laughs> You're a Green Day fan my, from way back, aren't you? Huh? Uh, sure. We all were, I guess, right? In the 90s. Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. Actually, I just, yeah, I just saw them not too long ago. I wouldn't mind going back and seeing them. But we talked to you last week, Matt, and you were, you were saying that you were going to do some things uh, with WrestleMania. Some of the stuff that came out, the gate was the biggest ever, I believe they said, somewhere like $48 million. A huge success for the city, for the, for the entertainment value of what that is. What happened? What did you do? What was your takeaways from WrestleMania this past weekend? It was fun. It was it was cool. It was a nice two days to be down there, and uh, and I've been in that press box like we all have for the, for an Eagles game. But then to be in it for a Doug of event, and it was filled with you know whoever you know was in there, and it was just it was like it was not an Eagles game, and it was a uh, <laughs> it was a little, and yet you had to remember where you were. People cheering and dancing and singing with the theme songs and stuff, and. You know, this is a working environment, people. But it, it was uh, it was fun. It was a good time, and it was um, something different to do. You know, we've, we've covered in this business. You get lucky, and you get to go to Super Bowls or Final Fours and World Series. And it's like, here I am covering WrestleMania. I'm like, this, this is this is fun. So we we had we we had a good time, and it was a good show. So what entails covering WrestleMania? Uh, do they make the wrestlers available? And I know this is maybe more of a question for me, but there's a lot of wrestling fans out there that are listening now. Do you get to talk to the to the participants? Do they have press conferences? How does that kind of work, Matt? Yeah, they they actually they started this fairly recently, from the last you know x amount of years, and not doesn't go that far back. But they have press conferences after like their big pay per views, and the press conferences for the most part are the guys break character and talk about. You know they're not cutting promos, so it's kind of neat to hear what they're saying. And they're also well-trained like talkers because of their their TV stars. So their press conferences are actually fairly uh, interesting to listen to. And um, but for for us, it's like it, it, like I'm getting ready to go there Saturday night, and I'm like, what am I going to write tonight? Like if if this is a you know if I'm going to a, this is a boxing match tonight, like obviously, and there's seven fights tonight. The main event is my story, right? But I can't go there and write a you know a, a game story about the main event because like it's not it's not real and I, I don't mean to insult it because I en- I enjoy it so I'm not calling it fake sure but like you just had to find different approaches and um obviously like we knew that Kelsey and Johnson were going to be there so I was like all right that's a, that's the story for us and then finding out that they were trained at the Monster Factory which is a school in South Jersey by this kid. From Paul's Bucks Sparrow, County, right? who's a pro wrestler, yeah, and this guy from Bucks County, who's a pro wrestler with autism, um, ADHD, t- t- that Tourette syndrome, um, anxiety, and he he says like wrestling saved his life, and here he's the one that helped get these guys ready for WrestleMania, and so it was neat to like we had to find a story, and we found that story, and I was like that that was a, that was a good one to tell. So I'll ask you this question that I've been asked a lot in in my you know career, whatever. What's the strangest things you ever had to cover in sports? Well, and I'm not putting it down. I am not putting it down. But I'll give you mine just so you can maybe think about it for a second. 
I go into the office one day, and my boss says, yeah, I need you to go over to Wells Fargo Center to cover the gymnastics uh, Olympic trials. And I was like, what? <laughs> and, like, here I am covering, like, you know, uh, uh, guys on the rings and floor things and all that. I had no idea what the hell I was doing, but you make it work. What was one of the things maybe you got sent to before, Matt, that was yeah. different, I'll say? Somebody always reminds me of this, too, and I think it's true. It's, um, that, 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 that Devin Horse Show out in the main line. Yeah. When I, when I was an intern, we used, we used to cover it, and we used to send our interns there. So I was an intern in 2011, and I went there a couple of times. But the one day I went, I had to write about the hat show, where these women wear these fancy, like, <laughs> hats it's a contest and, and i wrote about the devon horse shows hat contest and like that day i was like oh my god how you know this is brutal but now i look back and i was like you know i found the story when you know you it, it, there was really not a story there so it was a good test it was a good thing to learn just like the gymnastics thing it's like it's like that it's a challenge and you you found a story you wrote it like an expert and it's like i covered the seven horse show i've never been on a horse in my life but I did my best to, you know, make it seem like I was. Yeah, that 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 was the great part of the business. I know when I was in it and what you do so well in it right now. Okay, talk about good things in this city. Joel Embiid back with the Sixers, the way they're playing, Matt. They, they seem to be really deep. I mean, Ricky Council, the fourth, is getting some good time out on the out on the court now. They don't play Maxi or Lowry last night. There's a lot of things going on there that Nick Nurse, I don't want to say has to figure out, but that he has to play with. How do you see this Sixers team moving forward? Uh, it's such a different team with Embiid and without Embiid. It's like all of a sudden they're, we're talking about how they're, how deep they are and that the, you know Nick Nurse has the stuff to play with. And I just think that's the, the importance of having Embiid on the court. It's a whole different team right now, and it's going to be fun. Uh, I'm excited to see where they want, where they end up. I think they will play themselves out of the playing game, and. Uh, it would just be interesting if they get an early round matchup with Doc Rivers, and I just it'd be an amazing storyline, and it would be, in my opinion, a favorable matchup. But you talk about the guys that have come off the bench, Ricky Council, of course. I never heard of the guy, you know, before <laughs> he came to the Sixers. It's like he's actually he's pretty good. Like, like they have guys, Kelly Oubre. Like obviously we knew who Kelly Oubre was, but I didn't think he'd be this good. And um, it's it's just a great story. With you go back to the bike incident and and. After he has his, you know, best game of his career, and then he gets the bike, and then he misses time, comes back fast. And it's been been great, been a huge contributor. They have guys, they have guys around. Obviously, we know Maxi, we have we know Embiid, but they have guys around him that they've assembled. And you're handing them over to a coach that's a, you know, a basketball savant, and he and he's he's working with it. So when you when we talk about all of that going on with the Sixers and moving forward. I want to move it over to the Phillies a little bit. I, I, I brought up something at the beginning of the show, Matt, that in the from the fourth through eighth inning last night in a three nothing loss, they had runner a runner or runners on base with one or nobody out in in all of those innings, four through eight, and didn't come up with a run. Is this starting to be a problem with this team maybe Broaden it to organization where you go back to getting no hit in the World Series. You go back to last year, the slumps that they had in the playoffs, especially at the end in Arizona. And then early on last season, early on this season, is this starting to get to be a little concern or is this just baseball over a long season? I, I mean, I don't blame people for being concerned, but I just stress patience. Um, baseball over a long season is, you know, the course I take, it's April, it's early, it's most of these games are in cold weather. Um, it just takes time. Like, look at the last two seasons and how it plays out. It's a whole new world now with this new playoff format. It's not division or bust anymore. The division, honestly, doesn't even really matter that much. It's it's you, We need to, like, really watch the game differently than we watched it three years ago. It's it just – it's it's you have to be patient. And, and I, don't, I don't know how much to stress that to you. Even, like, we were going into – June and July last year, and you, you would look at the wild card standings, and you could pick off teams that you knew weren't going to be there in September. And it's so almost the same this year. You can look like the Pittsburgh Pirates, and, and no offense to Pittsburgh Pirates, they have good young pitchers. They got a guy in Triple A that's thrown 100 miles an hour. They're a good young team, but I do not think they are a playoff team yet. They're off to a hot start. So, like, it, it's early. You know, nobody wins a division or a wild card spot in April. It, it's early. The Phillies will be there where you think they're going to be in September. And 
it's like you're riding the ups and downs of every win. It's just a little, um, it was a little much. But but I do my concern really is like the way Zach Wheeler's pitching. He's pitching lights out, and you can't win a, win a game. Not that he gets a win or loss, just that, that you can't win when Wheeler's on the mound. So that that's the thing. When you have a guy like that, you have to win when he pitches. And to go 0-3 in his start so far, that, that, that's the problem. Because then when you don't win his starts, you're putting the, re- the reliance on 4-5. So you have to win their starts now. And you're chasing wins instead of winning the games you should win. That's a great point. All right, your Philadelphia Flyers lost uh, like their eighth straight last night. They haven't, they've, they've only won two out of their last like 11 or 13. So I might forget the number. It's so high. What happened with this team? Where do you lay blame? Or is it kind of a situation, Matt, that you don't lay blame because expectations shouldn't have been that high anyway? Yeah, it's back to reality, right? They like reality came in and they they lose eight straight eight straight games um, on the road last night uh, in a tough environment. It, it, it's going to happen to this team. They're a young team that had zero expectations. Really, the expectations were that they were going to be awful, and they almost made the playoffs. So. It was fun. We talked about the Flyers until April, and that that was more than I anticipated. Um, I thought this season would have been done by Halloween, and uh, it's just I, I I think you are feeling positive going into next season, going into the summer, going into the draft, and going into the free agency in the off season. You're feeling positive about this this way the way they're moving than you were a year ago when it was such uncertainty. And you had all these new faces coming in. I think they're, they're moving in the right way right now. And I still think Tortorella is, is the guy. I think he's, he's, he's a good um, leader for these young young players. Um, I, I like the stuff he says in press conferences. I think it's interesting. I think it's a mo- motivating pool. And I bet behind the scenes he's um, even different than that. The, the way he talked, he had the fiery press conference the one night, and he came back the next day after practice and talked. And it was real open and um like just like an honest guy, and I was like, I bet you that's more the guy these these players see behind closed doors. What was that that leader? And I think um, I just think it, it was a fun season. Like the Flyers were relevant for the first time in a while, and you have reason to believe that they can be more than relevant going forward. That's an even way of looking at it, and I I I agree with you. Like I I think it's disappointing. And I, and I I think you know something. Some people need to be held accountable. At the end of the season, yes, we're going to look back and look at the record and say, yeah, well, they weren't expecting that, and you laid it out so evenly. However, all you had to do was play mediocre hockey over this last month. Why couldn't they reach that? Kind of bothers me a little bit, and I kind of want some answers for it. Yeah, I I, I see that. And I bet you it's in the locker room and the players that they have. And that, that's where it comes. Like, you need to be a certain type of player to step up in big moments. And this was a huge – the finals, you know, everybody's playing for the same thing at the end of the season. So every game is magnified. And some guys are built for it and some guys aren't. And when you have a, a roster that was really built to lose, um, you're going to have a lot of guys that just aren't built for that moment. And that, that's what happened. You know, they, they got on the big stage. They weren't ready to be on that stage. And, and, and they fell apart. All right, Matt, we'll talk to you again next week. What do you got working on in the next few days? You going any uh, any more horse shows or anything like that coming up? <laughs> no, no more horse shows. They come back in the summer. Maybe I'll head back to my old stomping ground. But, um, <laughs> I have a story next week about um, Frank Wycheck, who's up up from my, my neck of the woods in the Northeast, um, played at Ryan, was a, obviously a star tight end in the NFL, through the Music City Miracle with the Titans, and um, he died right before Christmas. And they're donating his brain for CTE research. And he had lived like the last, I don't know, five years of his life saying he probably had CTE. So now it's just a story about this guy and how he got to the NFL. He made this amazing, you know, one of the most iconic plays in NFL history. And now his family waits to see if he had CTE and what what he was like at the end and what um, what that was like to live with for him and the kind of the challenges he faced and how he tried to overcome them. Can't wait to read that. Matt, thanks so much for all you do at at the Inquirer, and we can't wait to talk to you next week, buddy. Thanks a lot, Bob. Take care. All right, Matt. Be good. Matt Breen from the Inquirer uh, on the Comcast Business Hotline. It's weird. Frank Wycheck, I don't know if I told you this story. So the the miracle play happens 
what Music City Miracle Play happens Sunday. I just moved into our our first, like, you know, n really nice uh, nice house when you're married, having kids, all that stuff. The one you had to move into for, for having four kids. So I'm doing stuff around the house. I was actually hanging curtains right in front of the TV. Wycheck makes the play. They go on and win the game. I go to work. I think it was later that afternoon, and my sports editor comes up to me, and he says, eh, you got to get Wycheck and write a story this week. And I'm like, what's that? And he's like, yeah, I don't know. Find Wycheck. He's a local kid. Find him. Find him and get him and, and do a story. That's the sports editor I had back then in Mike Rath, one of the greatest ever. So I did. I was lucky enough, got connections, da, 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 and Wycheck found out I worked for the Daily News because the PR guy at the time for the Titans called me, and he said, I don't know what it is about the Philadelphia Daily News, but when I said that to him, he goes, yeah, I'll talk to him right away. So Wycheck was nice enough, and it's such a shame the way that all played out. You too, way too young uh, for him to lose his life. So look forward to reading Matt's story about all that. Just way too much of that going on here. But uh, Masters coming up, Part 3 contest. Ray, I know you're pumped up. Have you had time to think about anything that bothers you with the Masters at all? Nothing? No, I, I haven't. I guess, I mean, the overall, as you point out, I, I maybe it's just me being too, you know, happy-go-lucky with this whole world. Just being like, you know what? I wasn't looking for anything to really bother me about the Masters. Good. All right, you know? good. If That's... Tiger doesn't have a good showing, that'll probably bother me. I think we're okay. I got it. I did get a text uh, uh, during our interview, and it's from Mike from Delran. What's up, Mike? And, you know, we, we just started this show like a month ago. True. So well, people are still getting used to it, and we thank you for listening and for being on the YouTube page. So Mike sends to me, is Ray just bleeping with you, question mark? I get the sense that you're not a fan of his ball busting. Mm. I sent back, oh, my God, no, it's all good fun. I love Ray. Seriously, I no. I like when Ray busts stones and, and we go back and forth with it. So maybe I have to work on that sounding a little bit better, but if I ever gave that impression to anybody, no, I, I have a lot of fun with Ray. And like I said yesterday, getting to know him more and more, and uh, it, it's cool. I, I said, I, I, I'm at the age, and I have a huge group of friends. I'm lucky that way. I don't need any more friends. But Ray has fastly become one. Absolutely. Yes. Just as you've become one of my friends quite quickly. No, uh -huh. I, I think it's fun with, like, and this is probably deep in the weeds, but the, the new show, just finding new ways. Because I knew really how to, how to needle Andrew. Like, yes. you know, I could get him upset pretty easily. And, and that, was, <laughs> that was pretty awesome. Um Trying to find the, the way to properly little, you know, egg Bob Cooney on a little bit is, is right now a little bit of a, you know, work in progress it's for It's that me. challenge. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you did announce my last day on the air on Friday, and we did have people that did reach out concerned that I was not <laughs> coming back. They did take the, your, uh, oh, this is the last day of Ray on Middays pretty seriously. <laughs> I won't name names in my family, but there were some people that were like, what did you do to get yourself uh, thrown out of there on a Friday? Yeah, I, I probably didn't word that correctly. Uh, I think you it's know, pretty funny. Every once in a while, when what I said was that Ray and I were kind of arguing about something, and I said, yeah, stay with us, please, we're going to break. I said, for the last hour of Ray's career. Uh, and so I was obviously kidding. Sometimes you do things or you say things in a work environment that might not go over very well. You think it's funny at the time. But, you know, then there might be some ramifications. The best part was know. you inviting people to share their favorite memories of me over that last <laughs> hour, and we did not get a single phone call in that last hour. Yeah, I know. You, your mom texted you and said she was thinking, but she never really came up with anything. <laughs> All right, let me ask you this real quick. I, I'm, I watched the Masters as we brought up, the Final Fours if we, as we've brought up. All those things, uh, Super Bowl. Do you have a bucket list? Like, how big is your bucket list as far as sports go? Because the Masters is still on mine. I have not been fortunate enough, although I haven't really tried. One year at the paper, we used to send two people every year down to the Masters. And I was begging my sports editor for like a year leading up. I thought I was getting close. And budget cuts. We're only sending one this year. And I wasn't the golf writer. So I didn't get to go. But that's one of mine. What's what's one of yours? This is very, like, niche for me specifically. Um, it, I think it's just unique, so I'm going to go with this so I don't steal someone else's. I'd love to go to a baseball game in Asia. I was going to go when I was going to go to Japan in 2020, um, and I was really looking forward to going to a baseball game in Japan. I would love to see one in Korea. Like, I'd love to go see because I think the atmosphere there it's unbelievable. is unbelievable. So I know that we have a lot of, like, you know, American-based bucket lists, but that's one for me that I am dying to get to at some point in my life. That's a really good one. Uh, I think another one, this team has been mentioned and not in a favorable way, 
by Ray earlier today, but I think I would like to go see, obviously, an Eagles game, but I, I would like to go to Lambeau Field. I've never been there. I'd love to go to Lambeau, too. Yeah, I think that would be a cool place to watch a game, a cool place to go tailgate. Buffalo doesn't interest me all that much, although, I, I, what, reasoning why? Because it's cold? It's not like it's warmer in Green Bay. Uh, I don't know. I was up in Milwaukee one time, and it was an off day. Sixers had an off day. I was in Milwaukee. I uh, went to get lunch at a local sports bar, and um, the Packers were playing that day. And it was – I got there probably an hour and a half before the game because I was just looking to get lunch. I really wasn't looking. Well, then I had to stay because the Packers fans were so cool and had a great time hanging out with them. But, yeah, I think Lambeau might be on my list. Hey, if you have one, what's, what, what is, what's a bucket list for you? We'll talk about that if you want. 610-632-0975. You can do that. Call in. Let us know what your bucket list may be. Then I'll give you a trivia question. If you can answer the question, you have a chance to win Dave Matthews concert tickets which would be cool, a pair of them. So 610-632-0975. This is Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. Six in a row for the Sixers. I'm Ray Dunn. This update is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know the best rate for you is very based on you with Allstate, not one based on anyone else. Visit Allstate.com or call for a quote today. Joel Embiid, well, he came up big last night in the 121-02 win over the Pistons. 37 points for him.
out the window? It's time to replace. And right now, you can get a free in-home window consultation and free price quote from Renewal by Anderson. Plus, with our spring savings event, you can buy one window or door and get one 40% off when you buy four or more units. Just text PROJECT to 200-300 for your free consultation on top quality affordable windows or patio doors for no dollars down, no monthly payments, and no interest for a year. That's right. You don't pay a dime for an entire year. Text PROJECT to 200-300 to buy one window or door and get one 40% off. And right now, save an extra $30 off every unit. Hurry, this incredible offer is only in April. Text PROJECT to 200-300. Text the word PROJECT to 200-300. PROJECT to 200-300. Our friends at Bet Parks are big fans to bet golf, and Mike Rose is back with me. Mike, it is the greatest spectacle of them all. It's Masters Week. Well, like uh, Jim Nance would say, it's unlike any other. What special challenges does the sports better need to know about when you're approaching Augusta National? The greens are fast, the fairways are fast, and the players, you've got to figure out, you just can't make your betting selection just on who you like alone, so you want to look at your good players. I think that's what's going to happen come Masters Week, is that the top players are going to rise to the top, but in the first two rounds, you're going to see a lot of no-name guys who you've never seen before or heard of before. Maybe some first-time winners from this year will be at the top of the leaderboard, and then slowly as the weekend goes, they'll start sagging down the leaderboard. And as they say, the Masters doesn't start till the back nine on Sunday. Are you thinking overs, unders, or do you wait to see how the weather conditions are going? That's the beauty of betting at Bet Parks. You can wait till the last minute to make a bet. You don't have to make it a day in advance. I do like to get the weather forecast because if the wind starts blowing, especially around Amen Corner, where the winds will swirl around and many directions and tough to read it you think it's downwind it may be against the wind and they come up short and we've seen guys like tiger woods hit three balls in the water we've seen uh, uh, other people jordan spieth was going back to back with a lead going into number 12 in 2016 hit three balls in the water do so you, anything's possible do you consider live golfers versus pga tour golfers to sort of be in a little bit of a rivalry here i think that's going to be the big story of the week no question about it there are going to be 18 live players in the tournament i am going to be leaning on my bet parks app all mass weekend it is a spectacular way to be able to wager live wagering wagering by rounds all right give people a little tip where do they want to lean i wouldn't be surprised if you see a live golf victory but i'm going with xander shoffley this year he's due he is very due hey bet parks has all the ways for you to get in on this we love the bet parks app you can bet on every shot that you see on tv every two minutes you put another bet down and you don't have to bet a lot of money you can have a lot of fun love the bet parks app get involved today download it today for mike rose i'm john kincaid bet parks got to do it this weekend hello may i talk to my lawyer unfortunately he's out on the golf court i mean in court can i take a message another message is he using these as scorecards just call rand and mike spear already rand and mike will treat you like family not to mention they've won over three quarters of a billion dollars for their clients uh hello should i be writing this down nope we're done here here now dial 1-800-90-LEGAL or start your injury claim online by visiting randspear.com some people just know there's a better way to do things, like bundling your home and auto insurance with Allstate, or hiring someone to move your piano instead of doing it yourself. So do things the better way. Bundle home and auto and save up to 25% with Allstate. Bundled savings vary by state and are not available in every state. Saving up to 25% is the countrywide average of the maximum available savings off the home policy. Allstate Vehicle and Property Insurance Company and Affiliates, Northbrook, Illinois. Kincaid and South Junis. Hey guys, Andrew South Junis with my man John Kincaid. Join us tomorrow, 6 o'clock, as we talk about the Eagles, but the fans, the mental state going into this next season after last year's collapse. We'll also have some fun with the week one matchup in Brazil against the Packers. Yeah, I'm not liking that one that much, but I know Bill Calarulo will also help us get ready during the 8 o'clock hour for the NFL draft, which is now just two weeks away. It is Kincaid and South Junis, 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, 97.5 The Fanatic. Philadelphia's new morning sports show. Weekday mornings, 6 to 10, 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5TheFanatic.com. Coming up at 2, the best show ever with Tyrone Johnson, Ricky Vitalico, and Jens Gordo. Right now, it's Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5TheFanatic.com. 12.31 here at The Fanatic on this Hump Day Wednesday. Got afternoon baseball coming up a little bit later. We have, uh, I don't know, that hockey team, I think, plays tomorrow night. But the Sixers play on Friday. The Sixers play on Sunday. We'll see where they land. Matt Breen said he sees them playing themselves out of the playing game. I don't know that that's possible. 
But uh, I, I'm really bad at going through the ins and outs of if, the, if you need that information, the morning show is usually really good at it where, where John lays out, you know, if this team loses this and they win there and this and that and the other and, uh, and then this is going to happen. I just kind of wait until Sunday. After Sunday's game, you know, or before Sunday's game, they say, hey, if Sixers win, they're here, they lose, they're here. Then I'm ready to go. Not saying that's real smart of me, but that's the way I rock and roll sometimes. 12 o'clock hour. It's brought to you by Service First Heating and Air Conditioning. Get 0% financing on for 72 months and a $500 rebate when you purchase a complete heating and cooling system from Service First. Learn more at servicefirsthvac.com. All right, so yesterday on these very airwaves at 115, we played the announcement by Fletcher Cox that he was indeed officially retiring. So in the span of a month, you had official retirement announcements from your starting center, who was still playing at an all-pro level, from a defensive lineman that some would say was your best one at that last year, who played 70% of your snaps, who both of whom had a Hall of Fame career. It's not going to surprise us at all. As a matter of fact, it's probably expected by most of us that they're going to go in together five years from now. I think they're both first ballot. Uh, I think it's going to be a hell of a party. I think Philadelphia will represent very, very well uh, when that day happens. So it happened yesterday, and the talk was, uh, I was listening to Tyrone yesterday, and he had a great point. He's like, was Fletcher Cox a little more underappreciated because, you know, Jason Kelsey comes out and had more of the personality and had more of the, like, you know, here I am type of attitude of, of being out in front of everything and everybody loves that and chugging beers and wearing the costume and all that stuff. And I don't put that against Jason Kelsey at all. And then you have Fletcher Cox, who's kind of the quieter guy who, you know, behind the scenes doesn't need all the accolades. And I don't put that past him at all. As a matter of fact, if I was in that position, I could see me being more like Fletcher Cox than I would be like Jason Kelsey. But this team just lost two Hall of Famers. This team lost a center who was playing as well as he's played in his career, and a defensive lineman on a line that wasn't all that great this year played 70% of the snaps and might have been your better, if not best, player there. I, I got to throw it out there. Are we kind of overlooking it a little bit? Because it's kind of like... Ah, the Eagles should be good this year. Oh, it's going to be a bounce back year. You, last year, it ended the way it ended, but it could be okay. And you made the moves, and you got Saquon Barkley, and the offense should be okay. And the defense, you got CJ, GJ, and you're probably going to hit more of that in the draft and so on and all of those things. It's a Hall of Famer on each side of the ball. And when you're talking about a Hall of Famer, you know, there's 11 guys on offense. Right? I'm going to give you a little lesson here. There's 11 guys on offense in, in, in football. That's a There's fact. only two guys that handle the ball on every play. Also and that, true. And one of them just retired. I, I think it's huge. I think that is huge. And expect Cam Jurgens to come in or whoever it may be. It looks most likely like it's going to be Cam Jurgens. Can that be a seamless change? Can you replace you know, at WrestleMania? They announced that Jason Kelsey was the, the best center of all time in the NFL. And one guy kind of went back and he says, well, the case can be made. So you're losing what could have been the best center of all time on the offensive side of the ball. That's where the ball starts. That's the guy that touches the ball first on each and every play. And then you go to your defensive line where you have some young kids in there that need to get better, that need to be able to play a whole season. And you got rid of a Hall of Famer there. Are, are we giving enough credence to it? Have we talked about it enough, Ray? Is it a scary thought moving forward about, man, you're talking a team that lost six of seven that I, Bob Cooney, deemed as the worst team in football at the end of the year last year, and you lost two Hall of Famers. Man, are we kind of glossing over that a little bit? Do you feel like the city, maybe us as on-air hosts, of uh, the city fans of the team, are we glossing over it a little bit? It's funny because when you sent this, I saw this last night, and it's crazy. I thought about the show before I got here, which was wild, you know, doing work outside of here, just trying to wrap my brain around whether or not uh, whether or not we had overlooked it. And I think so much of us overlooking it is the expectation that everyone had going into this offseason. I think everybody watched the end of that game against Tampa Bay and had the expectation that Jason Kelsey was going to retire. 
and that um, Fletcher Cox would not be back. I think that expectation has changed the way people look at it because you were like, oh, yeah, they're not going to be back. But I don't know if we fully, in our minds, wrapped our head around the fact that we've lost two durable, high-level players on both sides, on each side of the football. Like, I think we have not yet really put ourselves into that mind space because when we talk about it, and it was funny, I think you asked me the question two weeks ago of, like, do you think this team's better? And at first I'm like, well, yeah, they got Saquon, you know, they brought in Bryce Huff, and it's like, yeah, they, they, they brought in players. But can you really, really in your head remedy the fact that they lost two high-level players, two massive leaders for this team, even if you expected to lose them? Even if you didn't expect them to be on the roster, you have to, like, start to put yourself in the mindset of, yeah, they can't expect to get all-pro center play from a guy doing it for the first time in his career. The guys they've brought in in the interior defensive line, we have expectations on them, but to be as productive as Fletcher Cox was for as long as he was and to play 70% of the snaps, no, we should be massively concerned about that. Well, it's funny because I'm looking at our YouTube page, and Khalil Wilson, a guy that's on here a lot, says both of them barely ever missed a game their whole careers. And, Bob, people lose players, Hall of Fame players every year. What's the difference? You all are just overthinking it. I don't really? know if you lose two Hall of Fame players every year. I don't for know if you a... lose a Hall of Fame player every year. I mean, to be in the Hall of Fame is pretty special. Right. You get five in a class. That means maybe, maybe at most five a year are retiring that are Hall of Aaron Donald retired this year, Hall of Famer. You have the two Eagles that retired this year, Hall of Famers. Uh, you know, it's hard to say every team loses a guy every year. Yeah, and Hall of Fame players too. I, I, that's my point, Khalil, and I'm glad you, you brought that up because I, I'm, I, that's what it's all about. It's all about the conversation. I, I think we're kind of glossing it over a little bit. This, this might, these might be two huge losses on a team that, let's not forget, was absolutely reeling at the end of the season. So it's interesting. That, that he looks at it like that. I guess we're polar opposites of, I don't know, man. I, I think you got to look at it a little differently. I, I think it's pretty big losses here. I don't even know if you can expect to replace the production. Like, you want to, but especially Jason Kelsey. Like, I can't expect Cam Jurgens to be at that level. I can't expect him to be, you know, 85% of what Jason Kelsey was. I'd be surprised if he goes in there and he's a, a, a pro bowler if he's considered one of the top two or three at his position. Right. It'd like, be shocking. And that's a massive change for you. And we keep going back to Jason Kelsey, which I think is funny that we started this conversation talking about how his how it's overshadowed. Fletcher Cox on that defensive line, by the Tampa Bay game, it looked like he was the only one that had anything going for him. Yeah. And he was one of the oldest guys on that line. It was just wild. It was just wild to watch. And now you talk about, we've talked so much about the edge. Oh, you don't have a sign Reddick anymore. That interior... Jordan Davis ran down Josh Allen, and I don't know if you heard his name for the rest of the season. I told you. He laid down there, was completely out of breath. And if you watch it closely, Ray, on the replay, mm -hmm. you can see his football body leave the body that was laying on Lincoln Financial Field, and it rises to the sky. And it never came back again. And then it was just, yep, that's it. I'm done playing football. I mean, I'll be out there, but no, 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 no. My real soul of playing football, it just left my body, and, and it went into the into the atmosphere, never to be seen again. All right, we have this and a lot more on the table. And Bill and Sal Bill on the cell wants to talk about Joel Embiid. What's going on, Bill? How you doing, guys? You're doing a great job. I love the repartee between you and Ray. Oh, thanks, uh, Bill. Very, Appreciate it. Very enjoyable. Listen, I'm a season ticket holder. I'm 74 years old. I go to the Sixers constantly, and I'm upset about one thing. And then I'd like to talk about the standings as well. Okay. The main thing is, what the heck was Joe LMB doing in the game when we were up by 18 with six minutes to go? It's what funny. Was that about? Bill, I was right there with you. Uh, I look at it differently instead of just being right away, what the hell? I look at it like, what are they getting out of this? Now, if you right. watch it, and I brought this up earlier on the show, Bill. It's a great point. I watched it. There was somebody at the scorer's table. Uh, Embiid got a rebound, passed it off to a guard, and he sprinted down the court. Didn't get the ball, but sprinted down the court. There was soon stoppage, and then he came out of the game. I think they just wanted him to work on his, on, on his, yeah, getting, getting healthier, getting, 
you know, uh, in better shape on the last part of that game and stay out of harm's way, something like okay, that. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that, but I want to tell you something. It's dangerous to do that. You know, you got, like, any extra minute he's out there, he could fall and do something bad. I just wasn't happy. As far as the standings go, I think we're looking at the wrong team. Instead of looking at Indiana, we should be looking at Orlando. Orlando has two games with Milwaukee, and they play us. If they lose one of the two games to Milwaukee – and they lose to us, we're, we have their spot. Their spot being, I should be so much better at this, but well, I, I, this is like a bad part of my spot, makeup. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Still be, they'll still be six. Indiana will move up to fifth. So Sixers would pass Orlando and move into, into sixth, and Orlando would fall all the way down to seventh. Okay. And, I, and all the numbers speak out. You can go and look at them if you want to. Orlando's 46, 47. Right now they're 46 and 33. Right. Sixers are I, 45 and 35. Right. And then the, if Orlando loses like two out of the next three, they're 47 and 35. If the Sixers win two, we're 47 and 35. And we have the tiebreaker with them if we beat them on Friday night. It's a huge game. All right. We'll have to take you at your word, Bill. Thanks so much for the call. Ray, that's going to have to be a project during one of our breaks here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm horrible at it. I really am. I'm horrible at doing the play out, who plays where if this happens and that happens. Bill just kind of laid it out. We'll have to make sure that that's correct. Uh, I think so he's we'll right. look. All uh, right, could be right. Okay. Yeah, I think he's, yeah, two games against the Bucks, one game against the 76ers. If they lose two or three, including one of those to the Sixers, the Sixers, I think they already won the season series. They beat them twice so far. So they would have the tiebreaker. Obviously, you have to win the two games. So it doesn't really matter. So that would move the Sixers up to. Where? That would move them to sixth. I okay. think. Old, I mean, it would move them above the Magic, and they need to pass one of the teams above them to, to get, get into to the top six. six. It would move Indiana up to five. Right. Okay. Sorry. I mean, again, I assuming know. everyone starts winning the games, they're supposed to win, this, that, the other thing. The way to yeah. move past the Magic is there. Okay. So that would be the ideal circumstance. That means the Bucks have to go. I mean, the Bucks should be playing to win because... Uh, they also have not had, you know, the greatest events of their season. Well, and they had some bad news last night where Giannis Antetokounmpo had to leave the game. Which could change. That. With a strained calf. I doubt he'll play anymore this year. They said he came real close. One of the things I read to get to a serious Achilles injury. So, I hate to see regular that. Regular season, of course. Yeah, the hate to see season. that. Right, exactly. Hate to see that. So, uh, we'll see how it all plays out. All right, Nick and Chris, hold on. We'll get back to you as soon as we get back. Uh, some more Sixers talk. Uh, Nick wants to talk about this, a similarity that I brought up in my notes also. So, Nick, hold on there. Uh, it's between two of the teams in this city here. Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5, The Fanatic. Tyrone Johnson, Ricky Patalico, and Jen Scordo. The best show ever. Listen weekday afternoons 2 to 6. The Eagles, the Phillies, the Sixers, and the Flyers. We have you covered all day, every day. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5 TheFanatic.com. Off the Glass is brought to you by Pella Windows and Doors. So the Embiid impact, it's real. The big man came back and had an immediate effect and could result in the team solidifying their spot in the playoffs as a team on the rise and one to watch. A pretty dangerous team right now. Even on Embiid's off night, Tyrese Maxey was able to bring the team a big win in double overtime in San Antonio with a 52-point game on Sunday. With just a home stretch left to end the season, this could be a team to watch headed into the playoffs next week. Off the Glass brought to you by Pella Windows and Doors. Book an appointment at hellafilly.com. Do your windows and doors need an upgrade? Are you tired of feeling the draft come through your windows and doors? It's time to call Pella. Based on a 2022 survey of leading window brands among homeowners, Pella is rated number one by Philadelphia homeowners as a premium window brand. Now through April 30th, get 50% off installation and no payments for 12 months. Call 877-98-PELLA or visit PellaPhilly.com. Do yourself and your home a favor and contact Pella today. This statement is not been evaluated by the FDA. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. When it comes to my lifestyle and diet, I don't always make the smartest choices. Touchdown! Woo! Hey, how about another round and some more chips? But when it comes to taking care of my liver, I do make one very smart choice. Active liver tablets from New Nordic. I used to have real issues with my liver, and at my last checkup, my doc was concerned about my numbers. But since adding a once-a-day active liver...
about 12.50. Don't forget, 1 o'clock, we're going to talk to Barrett Brooks. I uh, want to really get a feel for him. We ju- from him. We just talked about Jason Kelsey, Fletcher Cox, two Hall of Famers probably retiring. Uh, I-, I wonder if we're glossing over it. We had some great comeback. Khalil Wilson had a great point. Like, nah, it's okay. You lose players. Those things happen. Uh, yeah, two Hall of Fame players. Um, I don't know. Uh, I can't wait to hear what Barrett has to say about it. I'm sure there's more to it uh, than just that. No, nah, it's okay. You got other guys. You replace them. You go in and out, especially the offensive line part. I mean, like I said, your center handles the ball every play. Barrett Brooks played on the offensive line. He knows how important Jason Kelsey was to that line, how important a center is to a line. I'm anxious to get what he has to say. Nick on the cell, Euro 97.5, the fanatic. Nick, what's going on? Hey, guys, how you doing today? Doing great. How about you? Good, good. Uh, yeah, I was watching the Flyers collapse, and I couldn't help it, you know, remind me of the Eagles collapse late, you know, at the end of the season. However, we, we really didn't expect the Flyers to be there so much as the Eagles. We kept thinking every week, you know, they were going to turn the switch on, and it never happened. And I think going into the next season, you know, we got Saquon Barkley, and we assume we're going to have the best offense and a good run at it. But uh, I think we're totally glossing over the fact that you're losing Kelsey and Cox, the leadership, two guys that finished their careers very strong. Uh, it's just not going to be easy to replace. And then also I was wondering if I get a trivia question. Oh, absolutely. You can. Real quick, Nick, though, on this. I brought it up on the crossover this morning that, yeah, I do think they're similar between the Eagles and the Flyers in that you're both in playoff hunts. Of course, the Eagles were in a better spot, 10-1, and one, better talent, all of those things. But the collapse are the legs kind of which you've never seen. No. I, I don't. It doesn't matter to me that the Flyers weren't as talented. All they had to do was play mediocre hockey for the last 12, 15 games of the season. They couldn't even come close to doing that after putting themselves in the spot that they were in. So I do, I really do think that they're similar, much like you, Nick. All right, give me a sport. What sport do you want? You want Sixers, Phillies, uh, Eagles, or Flyers? I'll go Phillies. Okay, Phillies. Uh, And this will be a multiple choice I'll give you for this answer. Right. Who was the last Philly with at least 200 hits in a season? Was it A, Andrew McCutcheon, B, Jimmy Rollins, or C, Abdubal Herrera? I'm going to go to with the obvious, which might, might be wrong, but I'm going to say Jimmy Rollins. Nick, you are absolutely correct. Good job, buddy. Awesome. Stay, stay on hold so we can get your information for those Dave Matthew tickets. Uh, we'll put you in a pool with the other winners that we have today and pick a name out, and we'll go from there. Chris in New Jersey. You're on 97.5, The Fanatic. That's not Chris. What are we doing here? Uh Uh-oh, Ray, what happened? Can you get that off, Ray? There we go. Uh, Sorry about that. Chris in New Jersey, you're on 97.5, The Fanatic. What's up, Chris? Hey, Bob, how you doing? You hear me good? I got you. I got you. That was my fault. How you doing today? I'm doing well, you guys. So, I I wanted. this might be putting the cart before the horse, but I really like this uh, Sixers lineup uh, that they have now. Everybody's kind of back and healthy. Putting your GM hat on, moving forward for next year. How many of these guys do you try to bring back if you're Daryl Morey? Obviously, Harris has to go. You're going to sign Maxie to a max contract, so it's going to be Embiid and, and Maxie. And uh, I think Cole Reed's got it another year beyond this one. But I like uh, Oubre. I like Heald. Um, I would try to bring back as many of these guys as you can. I would probably get rid of Covington and and uh, Batum, they just got hefty numbers. But what, what's your thoughts on like guys like Melton and, and those guys in the uh, you know on those roster? Would you try to bring back, or do you think Daryl would try to bring back? Well, it's interesting you bring it up, Chris, because I've talked about how the way um, Nick Nurse is using these guys, and that Kyle Lowry and Maxi they sit one night, and then you're getting a lot of Ricky Council. You're getting Paul Reed with Joel Embiid. You're getting a lot of different looks. I equate it to, okay, they're looking at the playoffs, how they're going to pair these guys. But to your point, are they looking more into the future also? Like a Kelly Oubre, depending on what he might get offered from other teams, absolutely would want to have him back here. A D'Anthony Melton, you got to make sure with that back, uh, I, I like the piece that he is, and so mm-hmm. on and so forth down the line. Yeah, I agree with you. I don't think Tobias Harris is going to be back. Buddy Heald's interesting because if you look to see how he plays with Joel Embiid and it looks to be really positive in the playoffs moving forward, well, then, yeah, that's something else you're going to have to take a real look at, right? Right, exactly. And, I, you know, I don't know beyond what we have on our roster and looking around who's available next year, but you kind of have knowns right now, seeing how they play together. 
And if they make a good run in the playoffs, I mean, I, personally, I would try to bring back as many of those guys together as you can and, and see how a full year, hopefully, people stay healthy. And, and uh, yeah, I'm like what I'm seeing now, though. Yeah, it's fun. And then moving forward, it might be even more fun. Chris, you want a trivia question to try to get Dave Matthews concert tickets? Sure. I'll try uh, Phillies, I guess. All right, I'll <laughs> give you a Phillies. You ready? We won't keep it too hard for you. Who was the last Phillies pitcher to win 20 or more games in a season? A, Roy Halladay. B, Zach Eflin. C, Jamie Moyer. Hmm. Roy Halladay, Zach Eflin, gonna, Jamie Moyer. I'm going to say Jamie Moyer. Ah, ah, sorry about that, Chris. It is not Jamie Moyer. Jamie Moyer won 16 of the year 2008 when they won the World Series. No, the correct answer was... Roy Halladay, who won 21 in 2009. Sometimes you got to go with the obvious, especially when the inflection in my voice says, Roy Halladay, Zach Eflin, Jamie Moore. Kind of a giveaway. All right, when we get back, we're going to talk to Barrett Brooks about the Eagles, about how what has happened over the last month is going to affect this team, both good and bad, from the retirements to the additions. All that, a whole lot more. Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5, the Fanatic.
Coming up at 2, the best show ever with Tyrone Johnson, Ricky Vitalico, and Chance Gordo. Right now, it's Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic, and 97.5 TheFanatic.com. 1 o'clock hour here, middays. The Fanatic, Bob Cooney, Ray Dunn producing. Having a lot of fun today talking about a bunch of different things. Something I brought up earlier was the Masters and how it's a bucket list of mine. Also a bucket list of mine is to talk football with NBC Sports Philadelphia's Barrett Brooks. And that's just what we're going to do right now on the Comcast Business Hotline. Barrett, how you doing today, buddy? Good, man, good. How's everything going, man? Everything's going great. Barrett, do you have a bucket list of anything in sports that you'd like to do? Now, you're a guy that's been, obviously, at every football stadium. You've probably seen a ton of things. You're a deep-sea fisherman. What are, what's a bucket list, maybe, of sports that you'd like to do? Go The F1 at Monaco. That's my thing. You know, I, I love F1. In fact, I'll probably go down this um, this year again. I, I make it every, you know, the last two um, uh, years in Miami going to see F1 racing, you know. So I'm a big, big fan of, of, of F1, you know. Hamilton and all those guys, you know, it's, 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 it's just that feeling just going and being around that atmosphere, man. It's, it's, it's intoxicating, man. Very good. I like that answer. That's a good one. All right, we've had over the last month, Barrett, uh, retirements of, of probably Hall of Fame players with the Eagles. What I put out there earlier, and I want to break it down by each guy, are we, are we kind of glossing over that this team has lost two Hall of Famers over the last month? I'll start on the offensive line, your, your specialty there, with – what does it mean losing Jason Kelsey going forward and how much as a normal fan will we notice that it's no longer Jason Kelsey there? You know, the biggest thing, you know, if he has athletic attributes that, you know, that are really, um, really great, you know, him blocking at the second level, being able to pull and do things like that made him one of the best players on the offensive of line, you know, in the NFL, not just the center, but in the NFL. But also when you add his, um, you know, what he does as far as, how he's helped Jalen Hurts. He's probably going to suffer the most from, you know, we're not having Kelsey. I think he's probably the biggest thing that helped, you know, Jason Kelsey's development. I mean, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, Jalen Hurts' development as a player. You know, I think without him, I don't know if we'd have had the great Jalen Hurts when he was playing great. So it's a lot with calling calls, and it's not just his play on the field. It's physical attributes. It's more so him picking up things, him watching the safeties, him calling the defense. Him, you know, it might be. The, you know, on, on scat protection, the offensive of line have four down linemen and a Mike linebacker. But he might see a safety move over a little bit, and he'll see the blitz coming from the opposite side, the MEB blitz from the opposite side. So he'll redirect the protection and go, like, rip big, and then they'll pick up that will linebacker instead of Mike linebacker, give the back the Mike linebacker, who know he's not blitzing, get him out on the route, and then, you know, that kind of saves Jalen Hurts and him really calling things and directing things. So, his knowledge of how to play the game, uh, blitzes, and that, it, that experience that Jason Kelsey had really helped develop Jason uh, Jalen Hurts as a better player, a better quarterback, and understanding the offense just a little bit better. So if, if a Cam Jurgens is out there playing right guard, okay, maybe in the back of his mind, Barrett, he knows that he's going to be taken over for Jason Kelsey in the future. Maybe this comes naturally, or maybe he really has to do it. You know, it's, it's a learned thing, but... Is he learning what the center position does by playing that right guard? Or is it a case where, nah, now he's got to get over there and it's a whole different animal? No, uh, it's not a whole different animal. I mean, him being there on the, at the guard position, I know when I played guard and even the tackle, I wanted to know what everybody else was doing just in case, you know, I'm in a position where I can see something they don't see and I can make a call that they would trust that I would know it because they know I know the offense. Him being right there playing next to Jason Kelsey, he's like a sponge. He, he took a lot of what Jason taught him and applied it to his game. So I'm not worried about, like I said, the physical attributes of, of, of Cam Jurgens. you know, what he does. He's a bigger version of Kelsey, really. You know, he can get out there, block at the second level. He's athletic enough to do that, strong enough. You know, he might be a better one-on-one uh, -on -one pass blocker than Jason Kelsey. You know, a lot of the time Jason would call plays to, you know, make sure he had the double team, you know, a lot of the times. But, you know, he probably is a more physical presence in the middle of that defense because he's, he's a little bit big. He's like probably 10, 15 pounds bigger than Jason Kelsey. But what he doesn't have is experience, and that's the biggest thing. Experience is really what he lacks, and he'll get that as the game goes on, you know, but you know, Jalen Hurst can't rely on him as much as he relied on Kelsey as far as understanding where the, you know, hot route is, um, you know, who's got to pick up the blitz, 
how he can change the blocking up front to, you know, to dictate, you know, him pulling and getting to the second level and just put us at better angles and blocking these defensive linemen. That's what Jason Kelsey brought to the game. He, he had to learn that. It, it, it doesn't come with him just sitting there and watching film. It's being on the field, experiencing those experiences, which allow you to be a better player. So once he gets those things, he'll be just fine. But it's just his development as he goes on being center is going to be a definite change on him just going from guard. There was a time in your career where you stepped in, you were the starter, boom, here it is, and you have to learn the game, learn everything that you have to learn. With a Tyler Steen, let's just let's just make the assumption that he's going to step in and be your starting right guard. He's going to have Elaine Johnson next to him. He's going to have other guys that are, that are pro bowlers on the offensive line, Jalen Hurts, a quarterback, all of that. I'm not going to ask how easy it is, but what are his biggest challenges moving in for a Tyler Steen? Should it be him, Barrett? Well, it's different when you're going in and playing guard from tackle. I think that's the biggest difference because when you're a tackle, you're out in space. You know, decisions, you know, come a little bit uh, slower than they do at the guard position. When you're in a guard, you're blocking. You're, you're literally in a phone booth. You're the fastest way to the quarterback. If he get beat you, you're right at the quarterback. At least at tackle, he's out a little further from the, uh, the quarterback. But when you're at guard, you got to be ready to fight right there and there. It's a street fight. As soon as that ball is snapped, boom, you're right there, and you're fighting a guy immediately. At tackle, it wasn't like that. You know, you got a little more time. So you got to be more physical. You got to have that mentality that I'm, I'm not going to move. You can't move me. Now, if he can make that transition into understanding how fast the game is um, in the interior as opposed to the exterior, I think he'll be okay. But he's got to play more physical. He's got to be ready to go out there and really choke somebody from the onset of the play as opposed to giving ground. When you're at tackle, you give ground. At guard, you can give no ground. You got to mark your spot and be like, look. I'm fighting right here, right now. Let's go. That phone booth fight, to me, you can, like, pick guys out on the offensive line and say, okay, there's a phone booth fighter. There's a phone booth fighter. He's 6'6", 321, looked very lean to me, just naked eye and being at games and watching on TV. How easy, you know, you're a bigger guy also. Can he put on, or does he need to, put on that weight, more weight, to be in that fighter, you know, uh, phone, bu- uh, phone booth fighter kind of size no and it's, it's different you know i mean in in, in being in a stoutland type of office because stoutland stoutland likes more athletic guys he likes guys like uh jason peters you know guys that can get out and run be athletic you know that's why lane's played as long as he's played uh you look at jordan my lot of great athletes we already have one mauler in dickerson so i'm not worried about you know being able to run the ball we can run the ball left all day and nobody can stop us but on the right side they might use him as more of a puller they might run a lot of traps and they might powers where they pull and use this athletic talent let him get out in space if he is a smaller guy but I, I really don't you know it really doesn't matter um in this offense because they call it offense with their zone blocking and they also like to make sure that they help each other you know, i was listening to aaron donald and his you know he was talking on a podcast and he's saying look um i got the most pr- trouble from the eagles because i always had a double and triple team and that's because jason kelsey made sure he called plays which they would double and triple team him well, they can do the same thing. They can hide him a little bit, call plays that really put him in a better position to be more of an athlete as opposed to being a mauler. So, Steen, he'll be okay, but he has to see his mentality from, all right, I'm giving ground as a tackle, but i got to be in this phone booth ready to rip somebody's head off right then and there and be ready to fight right then and there. All right, let's go over to the other side of the ball. And yesterday, Fletcher Cox does his retirement announcement, which we all knew was coming and all, but... How does that affect this team? I, I talked earlier about maybe it's not just the play on the field from him, although he played 70 snaps last year. But are the younger guys going to really miss him? How is he going to be missed by this defensive unit, Barrett? He led by example. He wasn't really a rah-rah guy, but when he was out there, he got respected by, by the way he played. So that's a big thing that they're going to miss with Fletch, you know, his ability to go in there. And he didn't have all the, you know, big numbers that, you know, most defensive tackles would have, you know, in his position. And the reason why, because he was always a double team and triple team. You know, it's a difference when you have a player that, all right, he's just a guy. But we know that offensive offensive coordinators will lose sleep over Fletch. They would have to game plan him and make sure they double team and triple team him just like they did in Aaron Donald. So it's not necessarily – the, the, the numbers that he accumulated during his career, but it's more sort of respect that he garnered from offensive coordinators where they double-team and triple-teamed him. And I know it had to be frustrating for him because it was, he was always Batman, but he didn't always have a Robin. So it's really, really hard to really go out there and do your job 
and, and, and get all those you know, sacks and things of that nature when you're getting double team and triple team. So from that vantage point, they're going to miss him being out there and showing them how to play the game. Another thing, we, we lost a leader, you know, and, and I'm really looking at this roster trying to see who are going to be the leaders on this team. I thought this year would be Hassan Reddick's time where he would be their leader. Well, he's gone now. So that's another vocal leader that's left the locker room. Who are they going to have going to step up? You know, I was trying to think, well, Devin White just got there at the linebacker position. He, you know, it's going to take him a while to get in and be that vocal leader. Um, you know, N'Kobe Dean, you know, he's been hurt. So I, I think he's going to sit back a little bit before he becomes that vocal leader. But who else would it be? Maybe a Reed Blankenship. He's no longer just an undrafted safety. He's a starter, a big-time starter in the league. He's going into his third year, so maybe he steps up. We know Slate could be that type of leader, but Slate, I mean, he's he more of a jokester. He plays around a lot more than, you know, him being a leader out there. He shows you better he can tell you. But, man, that, that leadership role that Fletcher Cox had in that locker room and, and on that defensive line really going to make a difference on how they play the game. Talking to Barrett Brooks from NBC Sports Philadelphia on the Comcast Business Hotline. And Barrett, a couple of the guys that you didn't mention, the younger guys in the middle, where, where you have a Jalen Carter or Jordan Davis, you were in the league. You saw guys come in with high expectations that probably needed time to grow, and, and you could probably notice that from playing with and or against them. Is that just a case with these guys, or do you see something more specific? You know what? I mean, at, 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 at this point, we definitely need Davis to, to come out there and play like he's a first-round draft pick, like we expect him to play. Like he played the first – six or seven games of the season last year. If he comes in in that capacity, he'll be a really good player. We, we can go far with him. But he has to make sure that he comes in and he's that dude. Uh, uh, another guy that nobody really talks about, but who is a baller. In fact, I love the way this kid plays. And then that's uh, Williams. I mean, he Milton Williams is a baller. He showed the last half of the season that he is somebody that needs to be respected. He's playing for one more year on that contract, his rookie contract. He wants to be seen not just by the Eagles but 31 other teams. So he's going to go out there ready to fight also. He's going to be ready to, you know, put his hands in the ground and be a starter on this team. Yeah, I'm not just talking about him being a backup, but he wants to be a starter. And he better, you know, as I say, Davis better go out there and act like he wants something because I definitely know that Milt Williams wants to go out there and make some things happen. You know, but other than that, you know, you got sweat, you know, consistency. You know, I don't know how they're going to play this 3-4 system. Probably going to play like an over-under type of front with a, with a tackle and a nose. But it's still going to be a 3-4 front. But, you know, certain guys have to step up because this is time. You know, they have to, you know, stand up and be accounted for. Davis, let's go. It's his time. Let's make it happen. This is his third year. I don't want to hear any more excuses. He's got to be at a rock and roll. And we know that Carter, you know, even though – he kind of faded a little bit at the end of the season. You know, hit that rookie wall. I see him coming back his second year because that's when you make the most progress as a player. He comes back that second year, and he's going to be a dominant player in this league. He's going to make his mind up. He's going to be out there giving it to anybody that wants. All right, Parrot. Last question I want to ask you about another big man in another sport. You get Joel and B back for the Sixers playing the way he's playing. Where do you think this team could go? Where do you think they are going to go in your mind moving forward? And he's the healthiest he's went into the playoffs. So I'm expecting big things from Joel. I mean, the way he moves, man, he's just so fluid to be a big guy like that. They have to respect every facet of the game, not just down low where he's unstoppable, but even when he's out on the three-point line, because you have that type of player, he's going to get fouled. He's hitting his free throws. He's a complete player right now from, a, from the standpoint that they need a leader. He will be that leader. Maxie, he's got a Robin now. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, it beats Batman, and Maxie's Robin. They can go pretty far. I love what they have. They just need guys to step up. You know, we, we brought in guys now that, you know, to shoot the three, we got to have them shoot it. You know, um, this team is well balanced if they play together. They got backups now. I see them going farther than the second round this year if they can get it together, get that camaraderie with, with, um, with, with Embiid. I like it. I like it, Barrett. From your, from your mouth to God, the basketball God's ears, we hope it all happens. want to thank you again for joining us, and we will talk to you down the road. Yes, sir. Have a good one. Now. All sure. right. Take care, Barrett. Barrett Brooks from NBC Sports Philadelphia, former Eagle, joining us on the Comcast Business Hotline. Uh, it's funny. When Barrett was going over all the defensive players and stuff like that, I was glad he didn't mention them because it was going to be my next question as he was talking. But uh, this whole defense, we can talk linebackers and, you know, the unknown there and then the safeties and all. I don't know. I, if, if Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter are question marks at all through 17 games during the season, the way they've been, 
is 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 that is that going to become the overwhelming story? Uh, could that be what holds this Eagles defense back? Now, look, you have plenty of question marks. You're talking to Kobe Dean. Big question mark. I don't know who your other starter is besides Slay uh, in that defensive backfield yet. Uh, he he brought up Reed Blankenship, and he you know, and Barrett said correctly, it's your third year, man. It's time to go. It is, but does his athleticism, is his football abilities enough that, okay, you're all right going there. Ray, if I had to ask you defensively, what's your biggest question mark of the Philadelphia Eagles as of right now? It's still going to be the back end of this defense to me. I, I just think there's so much when you talk about the age of the corners that you have. When you look at, I know that, oh, they've got, they're deep. You know, Rodgers could be back. Ringo could be something. I just don't like, it still feels like a, a lot of question marks in one position, even if you feel like you're stocked with players there. I look at the safety, and Reed Blankenship was a nice third safety in 2022. I don't think he is, you know, I really don't see him as, as a starter, to be honest with you, after the way that last season went towards the end. And, and that's still somewhere I'd like to see them add. And then I look at that linebacker position. Like, you could get to the front of this defense. You could talk about the defensive front all you want. But I look at everything beyond that level, and I just think it's just – full of question marks it's a defense full of question marks because you look at where they were last season at the end of the year i mean they were one of the worst statistically in all of the nfl but i think the back end of it to me right now breeds more questions than what they've got up front and i still don't feel great about what they have up front if i were to say to you or to anybody else out there that here's how i'm going to describe this philadelphia eagles football team right now for this coming season it's a team where the offense just has to outscore whatever the defense gives up. Are you okay with that? Is the offense built right now, Saquon Barkley, A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, an offensive line that, yes, you lost a Hall of Famer at center, but you have his replacement there, and you still have all pros throughout that line. Uh, a tight end who's probably in the top five at his position in the league. Are you okay if I were to say, yeah, you just need a defense that doesn't give up too much, because this offense is made to outscore everybody else. If this was a year ago, I'd probably feel good about it. That's the way I felt about this team going into last year. Isn't this offense better now? You lost the Hall of Famer at center. It apparently made the life of your quarterback a lot easier. Your quarterback's trying to bounce back from a tough season. Yeah, like, and, I'm, I'm just answering the, the question. Offensive... I'm not disagreeing with you. No, I no, no. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a good talking point. It's a good conversation from there. Does Saquon Barkley over help you overcome a Jason Kelsey being replaced by Cam Jurgens. The offense, it's tough. It's really tough to say this offense is definitively better. Skill position-wise, yeah, they're better. I but love what Barrett we, said. Are we underrating that? Could be. Like, this whole thing, I, I don't know. I guess it hit me yesterday. I don't know why. You have three games going on last night. I couldn't wait for 7 o'clock to roll around because I love juggling around the games. But before that, I'm sitting in my chair and it, it just hit me like, man, we listened to Fletcher Cox retire today. We listened to Jason Kelsey retire a month ago. You just lost two Hall of Famers. And we're talking about, like, the draft. I, you know, I don't know. I, it, it, are, I'll say it again. Are we just overlooking it? Are we glossing over the fact that the Eagles just retired two Hall of Famers and and we say it as easily as that. And, yeah, I wonder who they're going to draft. That's what we move on to next. I don't know. It could be that. It could be a whole lot more. Maybe there's more on your mind that you want to talk about. I do want to get into the 76ers and last night because something really stuck out to me last night on a night when I'm watching and I'm thinking, okay, they're just going to, like, waltz through a win over a really bad team, and you're not going to get a whole lot out of it because Tyrese Maxey's not playing, Kyle Lowry's not playing. I'm seeing early substitutions of guys that I don't know are going to be in the rotation come playoff time. And then the lead opens up, and then the game starts to go on in a different way. And then Joel Embiid plays a season-high 36 minutes. I did glean something out of that game last night, more than one thing. But one thing stood out more than the others. I'll bring that up to you when we get back. Middays, Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic. Fanatic Sports Update. Six years win another. I'm Ray Dunn. This update is brought to you by Allstate. Some people just know the best rate for you is a rate based on you with Allstate, not one based.
97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5thefanatic.com. Welcome back. 128 here on a Wednesday afternoon. Hope your day's going great. Just imagine you get done today. Only two more left in the week before you get to a weekend. So good week of sports so far. Except for last night, kind of got a little depressed when, you know, combined the Phillies and Flyers lose by a 12-3 to score. But then you go to the 76ers, and that was a lot of fun. And I want to talk about what I took out of the game last night because it's a big theme of mine that when I watch a game, particularly basketball, because, you know, I was involved with it so many years, I want to take something out of it. Got to get something out of a game. Whether it's a blowout, you get blown out, close game, want to take something out of it. And I did that last night with the Sixers game. Maybe you're on board with me. But Mike from Del Ren, he wants to talk about the Eagles. Mike, you're on 97.5 The Fanatic. What's up, buddy? Yo, what's up, guys? How you guys doing? Doing great. How about you? Oh, man. You know me. I'm living a dream. Yes, you are. Um, you know, I, I had to call in. Cause I, I, Ray was starting to sound like a little bit of a Negadelphia in there for a minute. But we oh. talked, and I think, he's, I think he's all right. Like, you know, I think the improvement from Keller Moore, greater than Brian Johnson, is going to have more of an impact to this offense than, unfortunately, you know, Kelsey drop off the jargon. And I don't mean no disrespect to Jason Kelsey. Kellen Moore knows how to run an offense. And with these weapons, especially with Saquon Barkley on a team, too, this offense is going to be I mean, hand over fist better than I think it was last year. What do you think, Bob? Give me a point total for game for the offense this year, Mike, that is realistic in your mind. I think they could easily average 28. Okay. That's a, that's a really good number. Yeah, I think it's a good number. And therefore, you're kind of outscoring any deficiencies, maybe, that the defense is giving up. Absolutely. I mean, I still think this is going to be a 12-13 to 13 win team. I really do. I just think the offense is going to be able to step on throats and keep games close. Uh, and it's just going to be up to the defense to not, you know, give up that last play. All right, real quick question before I give you a trivia question. Yes, are sir. you okay or do you like the fact that the Eagles are going to play the Packers in Brazil that Friday night? I mean, I don't like that they're going to be in Brazil. I, I hate even worse that it's just all peacock. But, you know, it is what it is. It's a, if it wasn't a home game, I'd be less disappointed. But, you know, it's cool. It'll be fun. You know. We can get it locally, I think, on, like, channel one of the local channels. So we'll oh, be yeah? all right there. You'll be able to sit in the garage, the barrage, and be able to do what you're going to do, right? All right. Well, yeah, maybe. I don't know. That that garage might actually be a room for a child that might be moving back home soon. But we'll see. Oh, <laughs> no. No, I know. All right. <laughs> trivia question, Mike. Give me a team. Uh, uh, Sixers. All right, your Philadelphia 76ers. What player did not win Rookie of the Year with the 76ers? A, Elton Brand. B, Michael Carter-Williams. C, Ben Simmons. Uh, did not win it with the 76ers. Elton Brand, MCW, oh, Elton Brand, Ben Elton Simmons. Brand, Elton Brand, Elton, Elton Brand. Brand is correct. All right, stay on hold, Mike. We'll get your information yet again. For a chance to win those Dave Matthews tickets. Yes, Elton Brand was the number one overall pick of, I believe, the Chicago Bulls, if I'm not mistaken. All this stuff runs together. But MCW absolutely was. Rookie of the year with the Sixers. Uh, kind of never met expectations. Not, I don't know. Where was he taken? Like 12th, 13th? I should know this stuff. I was covering the team. He was taken, I think, 13th or 14th. Okay, yeah, right? yeah something like that. Yeah. Had a great well, debut. He was after C.J. McCollum. Whatever it was, he was right after C.J. McCollum. Okay, yeah. C.J. McCollum actually played with a kid at Lehigh? Lehi? Yeah. At Lehigh that, yes, uh, went to the same high school as me, and I, I think I was still kind of coaching there while he was there. Anthony Durazio, great player uh, in high school, and went on to play at Lehigh. With, and the new commercial, this is funny. Have you seen the commercial about the Army with that Mike Krzyzewski talks about? And he says it's the name on the front, not the name on the back. And, it's, and for some reason, it focuses on C.J. McCollum. Well, anyway, it, it shows him, like, shooting, and then it goes back to him at Lehigh Plain. Well, the kid that went to my high school, much younger than me, uh, you can see him in that commercial every time he's running down the floor. I'm so glad you brought this up. It see, I knew you would be. So strange that they have Coach K and they're doing the Lehigh game. At, yeah, why that? I don't know. I, I don't mean, know they, they played Lehigh they in did, the tournament. But they lost. Yeah. Maybe that's the point of it? Like, there's bigger things than me being upset by Lehigh? That that McCollum was the front of the jersey guy, and he was able to lead his team to victory? Yeah, I was just very, very confused. Yeah. 
It's I th yeah maybe I like maybe I, my brain sometimes doesn't fully grasp what's going on. So this could just be a dumb moment by me, but I don't understand why you would do the have the coach that lost. Like I don't know. It just I don't think there's dumb moments by you, right? No, I just I, don't. I think we're chock full of them. No, I really don't. I'm learning that more about you. Duff and Philly, you're on ninety seven five the fanatic. What's happening, Duff? So uh, really funny that you asked uh, Bob to, about about the uh, Packers game. That's really what's on my mind today. Um, I'm so upset as a season ticket holder. It's so disappointing. It's disappointing that the team loses the competitive advantage for that game. It's disappointing that we don't get that game at the link. We were you know, last year. Our home opener was a Thursday night game. I didn't like that the NFL did that to us. I didn't think they could do worse, and they just did worse. Duff, how long have you been a season ticket holder? Um, I go back sitting in my dad's seats to Franklin Field. Wow, because I, I have a buddy. I'm sorry. I have a buddy who's been a season ticket holder for over 30 years, okay? Obviously loves everything about it, much like you. But, man, the disappointment that he has has been coming uh, that has been coming to him as a season ticket holder from games being at nighttime, uh, lack of one o'clock games, games being more of an inconvenience than a convenience. Have you felt that way also lately? Absolutely. So last year we had two one o'clock Sunday home games, and one of them was New Year's Eve. We had to play on Christmas. We had to play Sunday night. We had to play Thursday night. We had to play Monday night. We had 425 games. The whole tradition of getting down there and the tailgate, you know, or eating breakfast and then heading down was really disrupted last year, and it was disappointing. And, you know, to be forced to make that choice on Christmas between family and the Eagles was, I think, and, and I don't want to argue about it, I think that that schedule had a lot to do with us running out of gas at the end of the year. It was it was uh, uh, it was a problem, and it was inconvenient for season ticket holders. This year, Bob, I don't know if you know this, we are paying for that game in Brazil. Is that how it works? Is that right, Duff? So so we we get ten games a year. One year it's eight regular season games and two preseason preseason. Right. The next year it's nine home games and and one preseason. We paid two hundred more dollars per seat for our tickets this year. They didn't discount us because there's only nine games, mm. and we're losing a home game, not a preseason game. So my price went up, and I only get nine games this year. Oh, yeah, that that's tough. The, when you hear people, I don't want to say complaining, but a little bit disappointed in season ticket order. It's something we've never gone through before, but I have been hearing more and more of it with my friends through the years. Stuff for you, a Dave Matthews fan? Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Can I give you a trivia question, a chance to win a pair of tickets? Well, after all this, i got to go with the Eagles, right? All right, you got give it. Give me a layup, buddy. All right, you, you know everything about the Eagles stuff. Most touchdown, Most touchdowns scored by an Eagles player all time? Is it A, Harold Carmichael, B, Brent Selleck, C, Travis Fulgham? Harold Carmichael. Harold Carmichael is correct. Good job, Duff. Hold on one second. Let us get your information, and we'll do a drawing at the end of this show to figure it all out. I, it is funny because I do have a lot of friends that have had season tickets for a lot of years, and my friend Joey Merton, who I bring up an awful lot, is one of those, he's over 30 years, and he was funny, he called me, it had to be like a year ago, and he's like, you know, Coon, I'm just getting a little upset with this, and it might have been after the Eagles schedule came out before last year, two years ago. He said, you know, I, it's just getting harder and harder, and he laid it out there, and Duff laid it out there perfectly, too. They don't, it, the NFL doesn't care about the fans, I guess, and I hate to say that because, you know, the fans are make what everything happen and all of that. But you're also talking about, look, look no further than Eagles last year. You had a game shifted from Sunday to Monday, a week before the game. And you had people, you know, like our friend Vince Rizzuto, who, who runs trips for many, many people. They got to work their asses off to change everything around, let alone can people change their schedules to go to a game that they already had planned to go to and all. And it's the first time in my lifetime, I've been around a couple years more than you, Ray. It's the first time that I've heard Eagles season ticket holders, friends of mine, 
get a little upset about the way this is all being handled. And I don't think it's an older thing. I know, yeah, my friends, I know, I understand. But no, my friends are, believe me, they're all into the tailgating and they're all into spending their eight hours down there. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you got to go to work the next day. I'm doing four night games and four 430 games. And it's, you know, it, get, it gets difficult. I, I, I don't Maybe you have some friends or, or maybe you. Is it hard for you to go down to a, a Monday night game knowing you got to work Tuesday and, and all those different things, right? Well, yeah. I mean, with, my, with talking with my friends, it's already it becomes brutal just with the, the nights. And, you know, we could bounce back a little bit quicker due to age, but it's not particularly easy. And I also think you, don't, you shouldn't shy from saying that the NFL doesn't really care about its fans in that way. I think it's pretty evident. I mean, this, this is something that I remember, I think it was the day we did the show at Rally House a couple weeks ago, uh, the best show ever, listed on the way home, and they, they pretty much did an entire, like, open on just what the NFL has done that doesn't care for the fans and doesn't do for the fans. And I remember over the summer last year, worked with Andrew and Jamie, there was a, you know, is the NFL too big uh, to really, you know, where we can't really expect them to care about us? It, they don't. They've made it quite clear they, they don't care necessarily for you the idea that they're going to have games on a Wednesday, you know, for Christmas is ridiculous. You know, the idea, like, they, they're just, they are basically testing the bounds of, okay, we're going to throw football at you. You're going to watch it. Ultimately, you're going to complain about it, but guess what? Your eyes are going to be on us. You know, it's the that boulder that uh, had the famous line, you know, love it or hate me, you watch me. Like, that's pretty much what it is with the NFL. Love me or hate me, you're going to end up watching the product, and we're left to suffer. Last year's schedule was not conducive for a season ticket holder. This year's schedule, I mean, if they're already losing out in terms of the money with the, the trip and with everything, like, I'm perfectly happy with them taking the game, over, you know, to different countries to grow it. I think it's great, a great opportunity. But at some point, you're really going to start bothering the fans that have been here through all of it with the decisions you make, with the fact that you could flex games from Sunday to a Monday, with the fact that, you know, the Eagles play two 1 o'clock games and one of them, again, was New Year's Eve. Yeah. There was legitimate, like, people my age, the decision was... Are you going down to the Eagles game? Are you gonna, you know, are you gonna expend the energy to go to the Eagles game? Or are you gonna have your New Year's Eve? Right, right. It's very difficult to have both. And I'll tell you what, I'll even go past the fans. Not that anybody's more important than the fans in my mind. But how how does Roger Goodell sit in a room with Adam Silver? And Adam Silver kind of comes in and goes, uh, yo. You, you you can't not play football on a Wednesday. Wednesday's our day. Christmas Day is our day. Why, why do you feel the need to have a triple header on a day that we have always basically had the air quote start of our season on Christmas Day? We have built this up from 12 o'clock to 10 o'clock at night. 12 in the afternoon to 10 o'clock at night is when we put out our product on Christmas Day. It has become as much of a, of a tradition as anything. And now you're going to throw three football games on a Wednesday afternoon? Like, how does it? There's only four commissioners you know, of the major sports, they have to interact. They have to have some kind of back and forth about how things are run, business-type modes, or just talk as, as far as the way they're running leagues. How does Roger Goodell explain that to Adam Silver? Not that it's like Good Adam Silver. Yeah, yeah I mean, but you I can't mean, really explain that one. That's just, like, I don't know. I If I'm, and maybe it's, it's why I'm not commissioner of the NBA or anything like that or the NFL, but... If I'm commissioner of the NFL, I'm like, all right, no, that, that dog has his day then. There's only four of us in the whole world. I'm going to let – he has his day then. I have my day and, and billions upon billions of dollars coming in. Really? I'm going to go and take that day too? I was kind of surprised, and if I – I wonder, and I don't know, I haven't seen it, but I wonder if an Adam Silver is sat down and gets asked about it, what his response would be. I would love to do that. All right, we get back. I told you I, I, I extracted some things out of the Sixers game last night that I didn't think I was going to get. I'm watching it midway through. They're winning by two and four, and Detroit's hanging around, a bad team, and you're thinking, all right, they're just going to get away with a win. But then it changed. Then it changed for me. I really did get some things out of it. I'll explain what they were and more when we come back. Last segment, it's almost closing time. Almost 2 o'clock, right before the best show ever. Tyrone, today, Bill Calarulo joining the best show ever along with Jen Scordo. We'll be back in a couple minutes. Midday show, Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic. The countdown to the NFL draft is underway. 
Tonight at 6, check out the Birds Draft Special with Andrew DiCecco and Bill Colarulo. Inside and perspective you need to hear. 97.5 The Fanatic and 97.5thefanatic.com. Hey, at FanDuel Casino, we know the only thing better than a win is a free win. And that's why they made Reward Machine. It's the daily free-to-play game that gives you a chance to win up to $2,000 in casino bonus. They've already given away over $100 million in free bonuses, and they're only getting started. Every day at 6 p.m., you get three chances to spin the Reward Machine reels. And there are three ways to win. One, match any three symbols for an instant win. Two, collect symbols each day for a chance to win weekly prize. Tyrone Johnson, Ricky Metallico, and Jen Scordo. Right now, it's Bob Cooney, 97.5 The Fanatic, and 97.5 TheFanatic.com. Welcome back as we close things up. Two o'clock hour is quickly approaching, where you will get the best show ever. 
with Tyrone. Bill Calarulo today is going to be joining them. And Jen Scordo, of course, tomorrow on these very airways from 10 to 2. Bill's going to jump back on with us tomorrow. So we'll have Bill Calarulo with us to talk everything Philly sports and more. So last night, I I'm sitting there watching, and, and we all had this dilemma going on. And I was debating. I I I'm not. I don't usually... I know we kid about, you know, that I like my beers or whatever. I really don't go out to bars and just sit at bars and, and hang out. Like, if, if I'm going with my wife or something, we go out to dinner with friends, you know, out to dinner or something. But And my friends and I like to go out to lunch. But it's not like I just, you know, go out to a bar to say, hey, I'm going to go. But last night I was seriously considering it because we have a local, we have a new local sports bar by us. So I was going to go there, have a chance to just watch, like, all three games, being able to sit somewhere and watch it. But... I feel guilty at nighttime saying, hey, I'm going to a bar to watch the games when the family's home and stuff like that. Anyway, I'm watching the Sixers game predominantly last night because the Flyers and the Phillies lost by a combined 12-3, to and, and quite frankly, it got on my nerves. So I'm watching the Sixers game, and it's going on, and Detroit, like, it kept saying, Ala and Kate Scott kept coming out of their mouths that, you know, they're just hanging around. They're just hanging around. I can't stand games like that. So I'm thinking to myself, all right, come on, what are we getting out of this game? What can you extract from this game that, that's good for the Sixers? No Tyrese Maxey, no Kyle Lowry. So I'm watching. I was like, all right, Ricky Council's out there. Yeah, he moves around pretty well. Can he be something, a piece that maybe Nick Nurse uses come playoff time? And then, of course, you're watching Joel Embiid. All right, it looks like he's getting back into shape. It looks like he's very, very close to playing those first 12 minutes of the game, which Nick Nurse likes to do with him. Full first quarter, rest in the early part of the second quarter, plays the rest of the second quarter, plays full third quarter, and then the fourth quarter you play by ear. You usually would sit him, and if it's a close game, he comes in around the eight-minute mark. So I'm watching. I was like, okay, Embiid looks good. That's great because that's something else you wanted to do. But I started to get aggravated uh, with the game. Just like, is that it? Is that all I'm getting out of this? Because I, I, you guys heard me say yesterday, I couldn't wait to see how Nick Nurse is going to handle all the different pieces that he appears to have right now. And then you hear that, that Maxie and Lowry's out, so it kind of dips you down a little bit. So I'm watching. I say, okay, Tobias Harris, he looks good. 15 points, 12 rebounds, that's good. Kelly Oubre, okay, good. And, and my excitement level started to climb a little bit. And of course, you know, all right, Tobias just hit another three. Tobias just grabbed another offensive rebound with a putback. Okay, he's active. That's what you want to see out of Tobias Harris. And then I look at Kelly Oubre, and I say, man, there's a guy that can certainly beat guys off the dribble on the wing. He's left-handed. I don't care what level of basketball you are. Everyone still has problems covering left-handers. He goes into the lane, finishes the way he finishes, getting more excited. And then it comes to the level of, all right, good. I really got something out of tonight. And that was that I watched Buddy Heald find open space, uh, be given open space through different plays, and hit five three-pointers. He went five of nine from three last night. I don't think I saw anyone on that floor play with more joy than Buddy Heald did last night. And it's because he has been slumping as of late, hasn't been hitting open shots, hasn't been getting very many open shots when he wasn't playing with Joel Embiid. You get Joel Embiid in there, they go pass, pass. You know, maybe it's a, a hockey assist from Embiid. They find a wide open Buddy Heald. Boom, he knocks down jumpers. Then they're doing side out of bounds plays or plays underneath their baskets. And they're acting like Embiid is the first option. And then they're setting other picks where Buddy Heald came off of them, found himself open, catch and shoot. Bang, he's hitting three-pointers off of there. That's what excited me no most last night. That's what got me going. That's what I extracted last night from that Sixers game. In a game that that's what you had to do. You were expecting a win. They're playing the Detroit Pistons. Okay, they got that. But what are you really taking out of it? Really happy to see what Buddy Heald did last night. All right, we have to pick a winner for these uh, Dave Matthews tickets that we have a pair of, and it's July 19th or 20th, I believe is the dates, Ray. But let me pick a winner out of here, and it is Duff. Our man Duff gets two tickets to the Dave Matthews concert. Congratulations, Duff, on getting your trivia question correct. Interesting day today in sports. You got the Phillies going on, uh, looking to take two out of three out of St. Louis. I'm okay with that. I'll take two or three anytime. I'd like to see a nice outing out of Aaron Nolan. I did notice that our man, Rob Thompson, I'm telling you, Ray, he listens to the show. There's no question in my mind. We made the statement on Friday, 
or I made it. I don't want to speak for you. Made the statement on Friday, and I said, I just want to see normal lineups almost every day. I want you to see your nine out there. Boom, let's go. Put them out there. Set the lineup. Hand it in. There's not much question. Well, once again today, it's a normal lineup for your Phillies. It's the one that you most expect. So it's out there. We'll see how that plays out. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Opening of the Masters tomorrow. I, I, I'm sorry. The Flyers last night was it. And it wasn't just the 9-3 to three score, which is bad enough. But, my gosh, watching that game, I, I just I couldn't. I, I don't know about you, Ray, but I, I just saw a team that became disinterested. And I, I can't have that to finish out a year. Like, I can't watch that to finish out a year. I can't. No, as soon as as soon as they seem to wrap it up for the night, I wrapped it up for the night and watched it. Exa- great way of point of of putting it. So that's that's where I was as far as that went. So we got to keep an eye. You have to keep an eye on Miami, Indiana, Orlando, all of those teams in the NBA that are around the Sixers. What can change? I told you I'm not real good at that. I'll talk to you on Monday about who the Sixers are playing. I, I, I I'm just not. I never have been good at saying. Well, if this team loses to that and they lose two or three to here and they win this and they win that. Just give me the next game. Next game is Friday night. I'll watch the Sixers with all interest on Friday night. I can't get into all the other things. I want to thank you for joining us today. We'll see you at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. And we're probably, hopefully, going to have one of your Philadelphia 76ers joining us. Stay tuned for the best show ever. You have Tyrone, Bill Calarulo, of course, Jen, joining you coming up. Thanks for being with us, 97.5 The Fanatic. 